Now it's time to download and install an ID. And through our discourse, I'm going to use an ID called IntelliJ ID, which is an ID made by a company called JetBrains. Now you may be wondering, what is an ID? An ID is, stands for an integrated development environment. And it's basically the tool that you're going to use to write a code in. And IntelliJ ID is like a text editor, but a very sophisticated one because it has a lot of features like highlighting our code, showing real-time errors and suggestions. You can run and compile your code just by a few clicks. In other words, it's making the process of writing code easier and better. Therefore, let's download IntelliJ ID. So I'm going to open my browser. And in the search bar, we type IntelliJ ID. Press Enter. And we click on this download link. And on the downloading page, you're going to see two options. Ultimate, which is paid. So you need to pay in order to download it. And Community, which is free. And uh, the difference is that the Ultimate has more features and Community has less features, but Community is not for our purposes. Also, pay attention on the left-hand side. When I'm currently recording this video, the latest version is 2021.1.2, which was released on the 1st June of 2022. And if you look at the system requirements here, if you click on that, you will see that this IntelliJ ID only works for a 64-bit version of Windows. So if you have a 32-bit version of Windows, this will not uh, work for you. Now, if you have Mac OS or Linux, uh, you should download the particular version for your system. And uh, if you don't know how, just uh, tell me in the comments and I will make two separate videos and I'll show you how to do. Now, I'm going to download the community version for Windows. So click to download the community. Now, our downloading, our downloading is starting on the right hand side on the top. And if you have a different browser, you will see this in a different place. So once the downloading is finished, just open this file. I'm going to close the browser now because I don't need the browser and the installation will start immediately. Now it's asking us if you allow this app to make changes to our device, click yes. Here we need to click on next. This is the folder location where IntelliJ ID is going to be installed. You can keep the default location or you can change it if you want. I'm going to keep the default location. So I'm going to click on next. And here I'm going to check this box to have a desktop shortcut. I'm going to click on next. Now I'm going to click on install and IntelliJ ID is going to be installed on my computer. As you can see on the left hand side, IntelliJ already appeared. Now let's wait until the installation finishes. When the installation finishes, just check this Run IntelliJ ID Community Edition and click on Finish. Now IntelliJ, IntelliJ ID is going to open. Now it's asking us if you want to import IntelliJ settings. So if you had the previous version of IntelliJ ID, you can import the settings here. But I'm going to click Do Not Import Settings and click on OK. Now IntelliJ ID is going to open. And uh, this is the welcome window of IntelliJ ID. And here on the left hand side, click on Customize. Go here where it says color team. So you can change this team because the default team is this dark team. I'm going to change it to light because the IntelliJ light team is better for tutorials. But you can keep the dark team if you want. And uh, in a separate video, I'm going to show you how to add more teams, not just the ones provided by IntelliJ ID. Now click back on projects. Click on this plus button where it says new project because you need to configure the JDK now. And now here we have JDK and we have in red in angle brackets, we have no JD, no SDK. And now here we need to add the JDK. And JDK stands for Java Development Kit. SDK stands for Software Development Kit. So Software Development Kit is the Java Development Kit, no matter how you call it. This thing contains the tools that IntelliJ IDE needs in order to be able to compile and run our programs. Because without them, IntelliJ IDE is like an empty text editor. So it needs those tools in order to be able to work with our particular programming language, which is Kotlin. Now, to download the JDK, and we use uh, Java Development Kit because uh, Kotlin and Java are interoperable. And that means that we can use the existing tools and library which Java already has in our uh, Kotlin project. So we click here on this No SDK and click here where it says Download JDK. Now, on this window, we select version 17, not version 18, because this is the latest version 18. We choose version 17 because this is the version which has the long-term support. And that means that it will receive bug fixes and updates for several years to come without you needing to switch to a new, vo new version when uh, that new version is uh, released. For the vendor, we choose Amazon Corrector and uh, the, 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 I'm going to let the default location. So I'm going to click Download to download the JDK. Now the JDK is going to be downloaded. Now the JDK has been 
installed and it's uh, installed on our uh, IntelliJ ID. And now we can create our projects, but I'm not going to create a project. So I'm not going to click on create. I'm going to click on cancel. And in the next video, we're going to create our first project. And uh, we're also going to talk about uh, a little bit the JDK and the JVM. So see you in the next video. Now it's time to download and install an ID. And throughout this course, I'm going to use an ID called IntelliJ ID, which is an ID made by a company called JetBrains. This is the same company behind the programming language that we're going to study throughout this course called Kotlin. Now you may be wondering, what is an ID? An ID stands for an integrated development environment and it's basically the tool that you're going to use to write our code in. An IntelliJ ID is like a text editor but a very sophisticated one because it has a lot of features like highlighting our code, showing real-time errors and suggestions. You can run and compile your code just by a few clicks. In other words, it's, make, it's making the process of writing code uh, easier and better. So to download IntelliJ ID, just open the Ubuntu software program. You go to search. We type IntelliJ ID and we choose the community one. So we choose this one. We click on install and now IntelliJ ID is going to be installed on my computer. Now IntelliJ ID has been installed uh, on my computer. I can close this and as you can see on the left hand side uh, it, it appears. So let's click on IntelliJ ID to open now IntelliJ ID. So we have IntelliJ ID community 21.1. And this is the default team, the light team. You can change this team by going to customize and click here to choose another team. But I'm going to keep the light team because this is better for tutorials. I'm going to click to create a new project. I'm not going to create a new project, but I need to configure something. And only from here I can. So here we have in red no SDK. And what uh, is this SDK? SDK stands for Software Deve Development Kit and JDK stands for Java Development Kit. And this thing basically contains the tools that the IntelliJ IDE needs in order to be able to compile and run our programs because without the, the JDK it's like uh, an empty, it's, it's an empty text editor. It, it, uh, so you need to provide those tools in order to be able to work with our uh, particular programming language. Now JDK stands for Java Development Kit. And this thing, Java Development Kit, contains the tools that we need to develop and run our programs because IntelliJ ID, it's, it's empty. It needs the tools to run and uh, it needs the tools to compile and run our programs. And here we need to add uh, those tools. And you click here where it says download JDK. And we select the version 17. We select version 17 and for the vendor Amazon Coreto, we choose version 17 because this is the version which has long-term support. And that means that it will receive bug fixes and updates without you needing to switch every time they release the new version, without you needing to switch to that new version. We can choose the version 17 because this has the long-term support. Click on download. And now uh, the JDK, the Java Development Kit, is going to be added to our uh, project. It's going to be added to IntelliJ ID. So now it's downloading. It's installing. All right, so now IntelliJ ID has been installed to our computer and we can, we can create now a project, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click on cancel because we're going to create a project in the next uh, video. So see you in the next video. Now it's time to create our first project. And there is a tradition in programming that our first program should be to output the text hello world to the console. And this is what we're going to do in this video. Therefore, I'm going to open IntelliJ ID. You should open your IntelliJ ID. On the left hand side, make sure to have project selected, then click on this plus button to create a new project. And here we have a few options. The first is the name. And here we need to name our project. We need to give a name to our project. And uh, the name of the project should start with a capital letter. And if it has multiple words, every word should start with a capital letter. So I'm going to call this, uh, and, and this uh, way of naming is called the uh, Pascal case. So I'm going to call this. Uh, this project hello world and uh, also you should not have white spaces in uh, your name next we have the location and this is where um, the project is going to be created you can change this location if you want but i'm going to keep the default location next we have language and here you can you here you need to select the language on uh, which this project is going to be cre created so um, we select Kotlin. 
if you Java is selected, you just select Catherine. For the B system, we select IntelliJ. And uh, next, we have the JDK, the Java Development Kit. And uh, if for whatever reason it says here in angle brackets, no SDK, just click on that and go down here of down of two options. It should say detect JDKs and uh, you will uh, see the JDK down there. You're going to see Amazon Coreto version 17. Just click on that and it's going to be added here. Next, we have this add sample code. And what this is going to do, as the name implies, is going to generate some code for us but i don't want to have that code generated uh, now because i want to type that code myself and uh, i want to explain that code and in the next video we're gonna check that to generate the code for us so i'm gonna click on create now to create the project And here we have the tips. You can keep the tips activated because it's uh, uh, useful uh, information. But I'm going to check this. Actually, I'm going to just close it. Here we have uh, those windows which says there is a, pl there is a pl plugin update installed. I'm going to close this. So what we have now on the left hand side is called the project pane. And here we have some folders which IntelliJ ID generated for us, but now I want to I want to show you how to check for IntelliJ updates because in this way we'll have the latest features throughout this course. And to check for IntelliJ updates, you go to Help, and to go down here where it says Check for updates, and here you can check for IntelliJ updates, and you'll see a window down here, and if there is an update, it's gonna say that that, that, that there is an update, and you can install that that update. But now it's saying that that you already have the latest version of IntelliJ ID and plugins installed because we have the latest updates. But it's good to check for this because in this way we'll have the latest updates throughout this course. Next, check if you want to check for Kotlin updates, so for the programming language Kotlin, you go to Tools, Kotlin, and go here it says Configure Kotlin Plugin Updates. And if there is a new update, you'll see it here and you click on Install and that update is going to be installed uh, on uh, IntelliJ ID. So there is no update because we have the latest updates. I'm going to click on OK. Now let's focus on the left hand side. And if you don't see, if you see something like this and you don't see this in this expanded form, just click on this greater sign, uh, sign in front of his SRC. SRC stands for source. This is where our source code is going to go. Then click on this greater sign in front of main and make sure to have the folder Kotlin selected. On this folder Kotlin, this is where we're going to add our code. But first, we need to create a file. And the file is the thing where we're going to put our code. So we right click on this, go to New. And here we select on the right hand side, we select Kotlin class file. Now, we need to give a name to our file. And I'm going to call this file main. You'll see the reason for this uh, later. So I'm going to call this file main. The name also should be in Pascal case. So we should start with a capital letter. And if it has multiple words, every word should start with a capital letter. And for the, from these options that we have here, we select file because we're going to create, as I said, the file. Now press enter. Now the file was created for us. As you can see in the folder uh, Kotlin, now we have main.at, we have the file, and also the, it opened the file for us. Let's uh, click there. Now, if you don't have the file opened and if, uh, and if you have something like this, just double click on the file and the file is going to be opened for you. Now, here, now we're going to type some code. Now, you need to type exactly what I type. So, type fun. So, while I am typing, as you can see, IntelliJ is trying to help us and is giving us some suggestions. So, he's saying, do you mean fun? That, uh, and if you want to fill in that for you, just press enter because I want to 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 type that fun keyword fun and it also added the space so fun space then you type main and next you need to put parentheses and as you can see display button now appeared i'm going to explain immediately why and uh, we put the left parentheses and when we put the left parentheses the right parentheses is going to be added automatically so you put the left parentheses and the right parentheses was added automatically then we get outside of the parentheses we press space now we're going to add curly braces and again we put the left curly brace and the right curly brace is going to be added automatically because IntelliJ is helping us. 
Now we're inside the curly braces and now you press enter and uh, it uh, added the curly brace on the third line and, and also indented this line for us. Now let's talk about what we have here. Now what we have here is, is what is called the main function. And the main function is the entry point of our program. So every program that you create, it, it first needs this entry point in order to be able to compile your code. But let's take uh, each part of this main function individually to talk about. So first we have this fun and fun is the keyword for creating a function. And uh, you can use fun keyword to create your own functions, but we're going to see that uh, in, uh, in future videos. Next we have main and main is the name of this function. Functions can have uh, different names, but main is a special one, as I said, because main is the entry point of our program. Every, every program that you create needs, needs uh, a main function in order to be able to run your code. And in fact, if I change the name of this function to fun uh, main, let's say A, the play part button immediately disappears because now uh, we don't have an entry point and our program can't run. So this is a special function and functions can have different names as I said and as you'll see when you're going to create your own functions that you can create, uh, you can give different names to your functions. Now, next we have parentheses we have, and we have parentheses because um, Functions can uh, take parameters and can do some work with that with those parameters, but our function doesn't take any parameter. But we still need to provide uh, the parentheses because they are part of the syntax. And we can think of the syntax like the grammar rules that you need to 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 respect in a specific uh, language in order to be to be uh, to under to be understood to be understood. And uh, in the same way, this is the syntax in the programming sense. It's like the grammar rules in which the compiler, as you, you will see what is the compiler uh, later, the compiler needs, uh, enforces you to respect those syntactical rules, which is uh, to have parentheses for a function in order to be able to understand your code. Because if I delete the parentheses here, now we have an underline which says uh, expecting parentheses so it's uh, it 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 you need to respect uh, the, the syntactical uh, rules in order for your code to be uh, to be understood next we have curly braces and we have left curly brace and right curly brace and this is called the body of the function so this is where our code goes so this is also called the code block because it's the block of code it, this is where our logic our uh, our uh, this for our logic, our lines of code go. They are we define them inside the, the 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 curly braces. So this represents the body of the function. And let's add some code. And I'm gonna type print line here. So because we we need to output something in the console. So we type here print line. So we type print. And while I'm typing, you should see a suggestion. And we have the suggestion print line. And we select the first one to fill in for us. And now we go inside the parentheses of the print line and we put double quotation marks. And inside the double quotation marks, we type hello world. Now we need to, we need to run this code. And in order to run this code, to compile this code, we can do it in uh, two ways first. You can click on this play button that we have here. Or you can right click and uh, you can go here where it says run main.kt and the code is going to be compiled. And uh, let's do it from here first. So I'm going to click on display button to run our code and we're going to see the console opening down and you're going to see the text hello world, hello world outputted. So the console opened and we have hello world. We have the text that we type inside this uh, thing that we have here. This is also a function. And we have this code outputted now in the console. The console opened. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna close uh, the console to explain what this print line is. This print line that we have here is a function also, but is a function which takes some uh, which takes input, and the input is this text. And this function, the, its job is to take whatever you pass as the input and to output that in the console. So 
this is what this print line is doing. And this is a function that we didn't create. We didn't type free, uh, fun print line and uh, uh, then we call it. This is a function which is uh, built into Kotlin. Uh, the, this is a function which is already built by the Kotlin programmers. So we just uh, call that function inside our code and you can use it. You, need to, you don't need to create this function. So this is the this is what this print line is doing. So it's taking whatever you pass inside the parentheses and it's outputting that in the console. So this is our discussion uh, about uh, the first program, which is to output some text uh, in the console, hello world. And uh, now I'm gonna show you that, uh, and now I'm gonna show you an illustration to understand what is, uh, what is uh, the JDK, the JVM and uh, how Kotlin and Java achieve this interoperability because uh, Kotlin and Java are fully interoperable and that means that you can uh, you can have a Java project to which you can add Kotlin code and you can compile that code and everything to work fine. And also I'm going to explain what the what the word compile means. And for that I'm going to bring a illustration here. So this is the illustration. And uh, let's talk about what we have here. First we have Kotlin source code and Kotlin source code is the code that we wrote, is this code that is um, meant to be human readable. So this code is w the code uh, that we as humans can understand. We can uh, write this code, we can uh, read this code, but the computer doesn't understand this high level, uh, high level uh, code that we wrote. It needs something, it, need, it needs machine code, it needs binary code in order to be able to understand. And this is where uh, the JDK comes into action. So our Kotlin source code, again, this code, which is meant to be human readable. Then it's when, when we uh, press on that pl play button on that, and when you press on that play uh, button on this button and the code is compiled, what uh, happens under the hood is that that Kotlin source code is, is uh, taken by the Java development kit, the JDK, and through the Kotlin compiler, so the Kotlin compiler acts like a translator. It takes that high level uh, human readable uh, and uh, writable code. It converts that code then into what is called Java bytecode. And this is uh, not the final step as you can see in this illustration. This, this is just the intermediary step. This is, is not uh, uh, converted uh, into machine code. Then this Java bytecode, it's uh, taken by the JVM, so it's, it's sent to the JVM, and the JVM then takes that Java bytecode and converts that Java, that Java bytecode in, into something which a machine, which a specific machine can understand. But let's let's first explain why uh, why uh, Kotlin, uh, why the JDK takes this uh, Kotlin source code and then it converts this so Kotlin source code into Java bytecode. And this is, is doing this because different processors and dif different operating systems di uh, need different instructions in order to understand your code. So if uh, we are not, uh, will not have this uh, Java bytecode, so uh, if uh, we, had, uh, we will uh, compile our code on a specific platform, that code can run only on that specific platform. But because our Kotlin source code is taken by the JDK and through the Kotlin compiler and it's converted into Java bytecode. And the Java bytecode then it's, it's, uh, it, it's send it to the JVM and JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine. And the JVM then because different platforms and different uh, operating, uh, uh, different platforms and different processors need the different instructions. The JVM is the one which uh, is doing the hard work what, of figure out, figuring out what kind of instruction that specific platform uh, needs. So it converts that Java bytecode into machine code, let's say, which a Windows platform can understand. Then the same thing happens to Linux. Uh, the, the, J, the JVM receives the same Java bytecode and then it converts that uh, Java bytecode into machine code, which a Linux platform can understand. And then it's doing the same thing um, to a Mac OS. So the Mac OS, is, the JVM is gonna uh, is gonna receive the same Java bytecode, 
and it's gonna convert that Java bytecode into machine code which Mac, Mac OS can understand. So this is how uh, Kotlin and Java can achieve this call, this thing called uh, write uh, once and run everywhere. This is because the the work of uh, converting that uh, machine code in, in, which, which a specific platform uh, can understand has shifted from the programmer to the uh, platform which has the which implements that JVM. So we just wrote our code, we run our code through the JDK, the JDK converted uh, that code in Java bytecode and then the platform which has the JVM uh, installed uh, it's doing the work of converting that uh, Java bytecode that we wrote into something which that platform, that specific platform can understand. So, and this is why uh, Java and uh, Kotlin are fully interoperable. So you can add, uh, co you can add Java code to an existing Kotlin uh, program, and vice versa. You can add, uh, you can add uh, uh, Java, you can add the Kotlin code to an existing uh, Java program, and that is uh, that is possible because uh, the JDK is gonna is gonna convert through the compiler all of that code into the same Java bytecode and then that code is going to be run on the JVM and the JVM is going to convert that into machine code and that code is going to run on a specific platform. So this is how uh, Java and Kotlin and this is why Java and Kotlin are, uh, are fully interoperable because they, uh, they, are co they are ultimately converted into the same Java bytecode and uh, you can also achieve this uh, right once run everywhere because uh, that code then runs on the JVM, Java Virtual Machine, which is doing the hard work of uh, figuring out uh, what kind of instructions uh, specific platform needs in order to understand uh, that uh, code that we wrote. And uh, in this way, that hard working has shifted from us to the people who implement the JVM. So this is how uh, the JDK and the JVM works under the hood. And if you find uh, this confusing, don't be, this, this is just a relaxed discussion about uh, uh, how the JDK, what is the JDK, and what is the Kotlin compiler, because I said our, our Kotlin, uh, I said previously that our code is compiled. When I said that, this is actually what ha was happening. Our code was taken by the JDK and through the JDK was converted in Java bytecode, then it was um, sent to the JVM of uh, which is on my uh, Windows, and then that is converted into machine code, and then we see in the output, uh, hello world. So this is our discussion about uh, the first program, how to create the first program, hello world, and this is the additional discussion about how the JDK, how the Kotlin compiler, and how the JVM uh, works. So see you in the next video. So in the previous video, we created our first program, and uh, even though it was a simple program, you should celebrate because uh, you created your first program. But if you want to make your program to do something useful, you need to store data. And in order to store data, we need to use variables. And this is what we're gonna talk about in this video. Therefore, I'm gonna open IntelliJ IDE. I'm gonna create a new project. So make sure to that on the left hand side you have project selected. Click on uh, this plus button to create a new project. I'm gonna call it variables. It should be in Pascal case if it has multiple words, language we have already Kotlin selected for the build system IntelliJ. And also make sure to have the JDK selected here. And now I'm gonna check this add sample code because this is gonna generate the code that we typed previously, respectively the main function and the print line to and the hello world. Text is gonna be now auto generated for us by because we check this uh, box add sample code and it's gonna add the code automatically for us. So I'm gonna click on create. Now our uh, project is ready to go and uh, as you can see here it generated some code for us and this is similar to what we did in the previous video where we created our, we created our code uh, ourselves. 
but we have some additional code and uh, I'm gonna delete this additional code because it will make things confusing so I'm gonna delete this part sorry I'm gonna delete this part and also uh, you have, may, may have noticed that uh, here in uh, inside this parenthesis we, now we have this args array and string we can delete this too because uh, it will uh, make thing, things confusing and we're gonna talk about uh, what are uh, arrays and all of that in the next videos now I'm gonna all right now we're ready now let's uh, run this code to see to see what is happening it's gonna output uh, that text like uh, it did in the previous video you should open the console in a short moment and indeed it opened the console and it output the text hello world like it did in the previous video so I'm gonna close the console now also let's expand this src to see the file that it was created automatically for us uh, this time and um, let's change this hello world text to print uh, another text let's say let's print uh, type your name there in my case it's Alex so I'm gonna run this code and it will output uh, my name in the console alright so it uh, output it hello Alex like uh, we typed here but um, it's uh, what we have here is pretty pretty inflexible it will, a better way to be to to do that it, it will be to have something to store this name and then refer that uh, that thing here to call that thing here in this way to be uh, a bit more uh, more dyna dynamic and uh, to do that we need to use uh, variables and variables are uh, are like some uh, containers which can hold data values and uh, let's see how to create a variable okay let's uh, put the, the the code below above our print uh, ln statement and um, if you don't know what a statement is a statement is a complete uh, instruction of execution now to create a variable we just type the keyword var which stands for variable all right next we need to give a name to our vari a variable to be able to refer it later to call it later and i'm gonna and the naming convention around the naming uh, variable is called is called camel case and that means that uh, the first uh, letter in the name if it has multiple words so start with a, with a lowercase letter so i'm gonna type user and the next uh, word name with a capital letter Alright, next we need to provide the ty type of the variable what, and that means what kind of data this variable is going to hold, is going to store to do that we need to put colon and next we need to say what type of data is going to store what, what uh, data is going to store and uh, we want to store text and um, to store text we need to type here string and string means that this variable is going to store uh, a, sequ a sequence of characters or text now we need to assign a value to this variable and to do that we put we put here equals space and uh, because we explicitly said here that we're gonna, we're gonna put text, text or string we put a double pair of quotation marks and, and we type Alex all right so now we create our variable we give it a name a type and uh, with, we've also assigned a value to this variable next we need to refer this variable down here um, and to 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 refer the, that variable I'm gonna delete this text first and to refer the variable we put dollar sign and after the dollar sign we start typing the name of the, the variable user and as I'm typing the IntelliJ is giving us some suggestions and it says do you mean this username um, variable and it also has this v here for variable so i'm going to press enter to fill in that for me 
And if I uh, run this code, you'll see the exact uh, thing uh, happening here. It outputted the text uh, "Hello Alex," but this time we didn't type the text directly here. We 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 store that text in a variable and we call that variable in uh, in our uh, println. I'm gonna add a space here to make things more clear. Now. What we can do is to change the value of this variable by uh, adding uh, below of our variable, typing the name of the variable again, user name equals, and, and now we can assign a new value to this variable. And uh, let's put let's put John here. All right? Let's run this code to see what it happens now. Now this time when this uh, this instruction is going to be called, it's going to print the, the new value of the variable, which is John. So, as you can see down here, it outputted the text, hello John. So, we can change the value of the variable after we assign uh, a value to it. But what you can't do is to, is to type here username equals 5. And... Uh, if you hover over here, it says integer literal does not conform to the expected type string. And in other words, it's saying that we said explicitly, explicitly up here that it's gonna store only text and uh, down here we try to put um, a whole number, an integer. And that is not gonna work because Kotlin is a uh, language which is, uh, which is called statically typed. And that means that it, it, it will check the types of the variable at compile time, not at run time. And that means it, that it, you, you cannot uh, run your code if you assign uh, a value to, to a variable which has a different type that, than, the, than the type uh, that you specify, specified when you declare the variable. This is why we get this warning here. And if I delete this, Now let's delete this. All right. Okay. The next type of variable that uh, also actually not the, ne the next type the ver of ver the next way of declaring a variable is using the keyword val. So if you declare if you declare a variable as val, val means that we cannot change its value after we assign uh, a value to it. So if you try if you try to assign a new value to our variable like we did here up here, it will not work. So uh, let's actually let's actually just uh, change here. Let's put val. Okay? And and after I did that, you, you, it immediately underline in red the username and it says val cannot be reassigned. And that is because if you declare if you declare a variable as val, you cannot change its value later. It will uh, you can put a, va a value to that variable only once, and uh, that's all. You cannot change the very the, the value of the va variable la uh, later. So let's ch change this back to var to have the ability to change the value. Now let's look at another type of variable. So I'm going to type var again. I'm going to call it age. I'm going to put colon to specify a type here. And now we're going to use another type, which is int. And int stands for integer or for whole numbers. Now I need to assign a value to it. I'm going to call, I'm going to put, um, I don't know, 10 or uh, I don't know, 20, 22. All right, so what we have now is a different type. Up here we have string, and that means that we're gonna, we're gonna store a sequence of characters. And down here we have integers, and that means that we can store um, only only numbers, only whole numbers. And there are different uh, type of numbers, which we're gonna look uh, in the next video. And if I try here to change this, uh, to change this, uh, First, uh, first, let's uh, let's actually let's actually print this. Uh, hello, Alex. Let's type your age 
is and here you put dollar sign and we call uh, the name of the variable we type the name of the variable age so we press enter to fill in that for us and if you run this code now it says hello john your age is 22 so it's now it's using the value the values of this variable in our uh, println and we can change for uh, the variable also the its value because it's declared as a var not a val so we can put here age equals let's say 25 and if you run this code the change is uh, reflected immediately in our code so now we see hello john your age is 25 what uh, we can't do like in uh, the previous uh, example with the username here we cannot put a string we cannot put here alex because we said explicitly here that this is gonna is gonna hold only integers only whole numbers so i'm gonna delete this let's put it again to 25 and the error error disappeared all right now um, let's look um, at what we have here because we have these underlines this uh, uh, great uh, light out of our types and every time uh, you see something like this uh, that means that IntelliJ is trying to say something to you and if you hover over here actually let's hover over over the type it's, it says explicitly given type it's redundant here and that means that uh, it does not need to we we don't not we don't need to say explicitly here that is going to hold a, a sequence of characters it's going to hold string because it knows this it can because it kotlin has something which is called type inference and that means that it can infer the type of the variable by the value we assign to it in our case we assign some text so if i delete the type here now it's still working and if i uh, as you can see if i if i put here if, let's say if i try to put here username sorry username equals to three it's still uh, treated as a string because it infer it it, it it infer the type uh, by the value you assign to it and uh, similarly this uh, this uh, thing uh, applies to to our uh, int type so if i delete this it's still working it's still treating it's still treating this as a as an int so if you try to put here age equals to a text i don't know uh, we, again we have this error error and if however it says type mismatch require int and found string and that means that it's still uh, it's still treating this uh, variable as an int because as i said it, it has something which is called type inference and it, it can infer the type of the variable by the value you assign to it all right this is uh, our discussion about variables there are more types of variables and we're going to look at that uh, other types in the next videos and uh, collectively they are called data types okay you can remove this space if you want so i'm going to end this video now and see you in the next video so while i was recording this course uh, jetbrains have released a new version of intellij ide and you will see in uh, the course when you when i create a new project you will see a different window it's not that different it's slightly different than this window than the window that you will see when you download intellij id which is this version now which has this window and in, when you see this window here you just need to specify a name here you, you specify the location for the language you select kotlin here you select for the build system intellij and you make sure to have the jdk here and you also check this add sample code and that is going to generate the main function uh, for you and you click on create and the project is going to be created uh, for you so i thought that it's good to tell you about this and uh, if you, you will see this window and if this window changes in the future i'm going to release a new video in which i'm going to show you how to if they change the specifically the window of creating a new project how to create a new project with that window but for now this is the window of uh, the latest version 
All right, so in the last video we talked about variables and we seen there that we can store different data in our variables and uh, we looked at two different data types or types in short. And that was the string type and the int type. And the string type was used for storing sequence of characters or text and the int type was used for storing whole numbers. And in this video we're going to take, take a deeper look at uh, the integer data type and we're also going to extend our understanding to more uh, types for storing whole numbers and that is the byte, the short and the long data types for storing whole numbers and you're gonna see what is the difference between these, uh, these types. Now let's open IntelliJ ID. I'm gonna open my IntelliJ ID. On the left side make sure that project is created, uh, selected, click on new project. On the left hand side make sure the Kotlin is selected and here we need to give a name to our project. Again it should be in Pascal case. I'm gonna type uh, byte short int and long. Uh, now I go down here and it's gonna select IntelliJ and uh, make sure that the JDK is selected. Click on next to create a new project and click on finish. Now our project is gonna be created. And down here again is setting IntelliJ is setting up our project. On the left hand side we have our uh, project pane. I can expand this SRC to see our file, our main file that we created first. Now it was generated for us automatically. I'm gonna delete this code and here we have something which is called comments or a comment, but we're gonna look at comments uh, in a separate video. So I'm gonna delete this. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna add a space here. I'm gonna delete this. You can keep the Rx there. It is not gonna affect your code in any way, but uh, I want to make it consistent with my previous videos. But you can keep the Rx uh, there. It, uh, it will make no difference in uh, the way you, your code is compiled. Now, let's add the code that you had previously. And previously we had the uh, we had a variable of type uh, string for storing uh, text, specifically we store our name there. So I'm gonna type the var keyword because uh, in the last video we we established that we want to change this value later, var. And uh, here we need to give a name to our variable. I'm gonna call it name like in the previous video. For the type I'm gonna choose string. And uh, I'm gonna put equals and now time to assign a value to it. I'm gonna put again uh, our text, all right? And down here I'm gonna declare a variable, but, but this time I'm gonna declare it as a val. I'm gonna type, I'm gonna type for the name uh, age. And for the type, I'm gonna put int for storing the whole numbers. I'm gonna put 22. And uh, we see there that uh, we can delete the type here because Kotlin has something which is called type inference and that means that it, it can infer the type of the variable by the value we assign to it. So we can delete this type here and our code is gonna still be valid and if I hover over here, if you look at here it's still treating this variable as type of string. So, but uh, in this video I'm gonna leave the string type. I'm gonna delete this because we're gonna look at the uh, integer more closely. And uh, here uh, let's uh, let's change its value, let's change its name to number. And it's also gonna be an int. And let's take a deeper look. First let's see what is an integer. We know that it's a whole number so you can store uh, whole numbers. But what is, uh, it's, uh, it, it has a range, you can uh, put whatever uh, value you want. Actually there is a range, there is a minimum and maximum value that you can put in, a, in an integer data type. So, and to get that minimum and maximum value we type, I'm gonna put a space here to make code, the code more clear. I'm gonna type val, I'm gonna type max integer value and for the type I'm gonna choose int or you can let it infer the type. You can 
I'm gonna actually put it, the type here, but you can let it infer the type if you want. Equals, and now we type int dot, and IntelliJ is giving us some suggestions here. I'm gonna choose max value. And uh, this code on the right here is gonna give us, actually the entire code is gonna give us the maximum value in a uh, integer and if you don't uh, if this seems confusing int that and uh, this uh, uppercase uh, uh, you know you don't need to worry about that for now you just, you just need to know that in this way you can get the maximum value to out to be output in our console and for the minimum value we're gonna type val min integer value for the type I'm gonna choose int now I'm gonna type again int dot and again I'm gonna choose from here mean value. Now to print these two values, I'm gonna just delete this text here and I'm gonna type int integer or int maximum value is and I'm gonna put dollar sign to get the value max integer value right and below this code we're gonna type another println and here we're gonna put a pair of quotation marks again and we're gonna type int minimum value is dollar sign Again, IntelliJ is giving a suggestion. She's going to choose minimum integer value. Now, let's print this. Uh, let's output this uh, code to see which, what is the minimum or maximum value which can be stored in an int integer data type. And if you want, you can add a space here to make things more clear. Right, and as you can see down here when the console opened that the maximum value is 2 billion and 147 million and so on and the minimum value is 2 billion and 147 million and so on and uh, these are the minimum and maximum values which can be stored in an int so that means that you cannot put a value which is which is bigger than this maximum value or the which, or value which is uh, uh, which is bigger than the minimum values and so if you try to to assign and to confirm that if you try to assign here a value which is bigger than the maximum integer value so let's uh, type uh, number and uh, now we may, we may be spotted the problem here if i try to put here equals it says val cannot be reassigned so let's declare this as a var because i want to change this value now i'm gonna put equals and i'm just gonna copy this i'm gonna put it here now if i increase this number by one Let's say that I put uh, 8 here. Now it immediately shows an warning. And if I hover over here, it says that the integer literal does not conform to the expected type int. And you may be wondering how this makes any sense because here, up here, we said explicitly that this uh, variable is going to store integers or whole numbers. And down here we have a whole number. But the problem now is that this whole number is bigger than the maximum integer value which can be stored in an int which is 2 billion 147 million and 40,000 but now we have uh, a bigger number and um, to to store this number we need to use a different data type or a different type and we're gonna see in the next videos precisely what type we need to use and what type we gonna use for storing a bigger number than the integer uh, than the integer maximum value all right also, it's important to know because it said it says here now the integer 
liter. So you may be wondering what is this liter? The liter is the value that we assign to our variable. And it's called the liter because we assign we assign the value directly here. So we don't have a what is called a symbolic name here. And we're gonna see what is a symbolic name in the next uh, videos. Now I'm gonna edit this video now. I'm gonna change it back to seven. And uh, also you can delete the types here. The code is gonna still work. The code is gonna still be valid. And if you delete the type up here also, because uh, the type can be inferred, like we talked about. Now, I'm gonna end this video now and see you in the next video. Alright, so in the last video we looked at the integer data type and we saw there that you can store a minimum and a maximum value in an integer. And uh, in this video we're gonna look at the next three data types or types for storing whole numbers and those are the byte, the short and the long. And let's start with the byte to see what is the minimum and maximum value which can be stored in a, in a byte. So I'm going to type val my max byte value. For the type I'm going to choose byte equals byte dot max value. Below I'm gonna type again val. This time I'm gonna I'm gonna call it my min my uh, byte value. For the type I'm gonna choose byte. I'm gonna put equals. I'm gonna type byte dot min value. And now to print this uh, to print the value of those uh, variables, I'm gonna copy this to println statements. I'm going to paste it below here. I'm going to change the text to byte. And here uh, we need to call our variables. We need to refer our variables. So I'm going to type my max byte value. Just press enter to fill that uh, for you. And below here I'm going to type my min byte value. Now let's print this uh, two values to the console to see what is the minimum and maximum value which can be stored in a byte data type. So I'm gonna run this code. Now the console should uh, open in a short moment. All right, as you can see the byte maximum value is 127 and the byte minimum value is minus 128. And in contrast with uh, those uh, minimum and maximum values for the integer uh, type, you can see that these two are very, very small compared to that. Now let's look at the next, uh, the next type, which is the short, and I'm gonna do the same, uh, the same. Uh, I'm gonna type the same code as sorry, the same code that you had previously, but. Uh, so I'm going to put a space to make it more clear. I'm going to close the console. So let's see the short type, right? So I'm going to type val my max short value. I'm going to put x equals, uh, actually let's uh, choose short here for the type, equals short that max value, all right? I'm gonna press enter, I'm gonna type again val my min short short value and for the type again short equals short that mean value. Now let's copy this. Uh, actually we have already copied that so I'm gonna paste that here to print uh, to print our uh, minimum and maximum values. So I'm gonna change this to short this text. I'm gonna change it here too. And now we need to call 
those variables because as you can see right now they are gray out and uh, if you hover over this is the variable my max short values never use and that's a clever way to see when a variable is used or not all right let's change it let's change the name here because we want to refer those variables my max short value and uh, here we're gonna type my mean short value right let's print this to see now what is the minimum and maximum value can be stored in a short all right as you can see down here it outputted that the short maximum value is minus 32,767 and for uh, the short uh, minimum value is uh, minus 327768 all right and if you look at uh, the previous uh, data types you can see that uh, the integer is the the biggest is the is the type which can uh, store the biggest number but uh, there is one actually which is bigger than the integer so i'm gonna type now the next data type which you're gonna look at and that is the long which is uh, much bigger than the int integer so i'm going to close the console i'm going to type the same code i'm going to type val my max long value for the type i'm going to choose long i'm going to put equals long i'm going to put that max value again val my mean long value for the type i'm going to choose long equals again i'm going to choose now i'm going to type again long that minimum value now i'm going to paste that code uh, below here to output our uh, variables to output uh, the minimum and maximum value which can be stored in a long data type so i'm going to so I'm going to change this to long. I'm going to change this text also to long. Now I need to refer this those two variables up here from uh, up here. So I'm going to delete this. I'm going to type my max long value. So I'm going to choose that. Press enter. And here gonna choose uh, I'm gonna type my mean long value. Let's output this uh, code to see let's run actually our code to see what is the minimum maximum value can be stored in a long data type and as you can see the range for the long is much bigger contrast that with the the integer uh, data type you can see that it's a lot uh, lot bigger this number so the long is has a more uh, is has a range which is uh, much bigger than the integer and uh, i'm gonna end this video now and in the next video we're gonna look at how we can use those uh, types and um, what are the relationships between uh, between them right so I'm going to end this video now and see you in the next. All right, now it's time to use those four uh, data types for storing whole numbers in our code. So I'm going to type some code below of those uh, present ln statements. I'm going to type val because I want this variable to be immutable. I don't want to change this value later. I'm going to call it my number. It should be in camel case like our last names. And for the type, I'm not... Uh, define explicitly a type here i'm going to put equals and i'm going to put uh, the literal value 28 and if i hover over my number you can see that the type which uh, was inferred is an int now you may be wondering how this uh, makes any sense because this 28 can easily fit in a byte or in a short or in a long and that is because the default data type which is automatically inferred is the integer so actually let's confirm that uh, this can fit easily in uh, other data types by running our code to see what are the minimum and you can see that that number can easily fit in any of those data types from this list and um, 
That is not happening because the automatically, as I said, the default type which is inferred is the integer. And if you want this type to be a byte, you need to explicitly say explicitly say here byte. Now, if I hover over here, you can see that now it's a byte. And if I want to be a short, we need to type explicitly here short. So if I hover over here, now this is a short. And if I want to be, I want this to be a long, I just type again here long. And for the long, there are two ways. This is the first way to type the, the, the type explicitly here. Sorry, hover over here. It's a long. Or we can put a L suffix at the end of our uh, number. But if I put a lowercase letter, you, it immediately shows this warning which says use an uppercase L instead of L. And that is because this can easily be confused with one. So I'm going to put uh, an uppercase L. And if I hover over here, now this uh, is a long, even though this can uh, be can be easy, can easily fit in any other data type. And uh, if I delete this cell and if I exceed the maximum value which can be stored in an integer, let's say I put 28 or something here. And if I hover over here, you can see that now it inferred the type to be as a long because now this number that you have here exceeds the maximum value which can be stored in an int. And um, you may be wondering now when to use one or the other, when to use the byte, when to use the short, when to use the long. And um, you will find the, the answer with the, the practice, where, with the working with them. But uh, if I run this code, the byte and the short will be used in, vor in very specific cases. And most of the time you'll be working with the integer uh, data type, right? Now I'm going to end this video and see you in the next video. We're going to talk about the next data types, which are the floating data types. And those are types which can hold uh, numbers which have a fractional part or decimals. So see you in the next video. All right, before we start our discussion about the floating point numbers, respectively about the float and double data type, it's important to know what are the difference between the data types for storing whole numbers under the hood because we know now that uh, there is a minimum maximum value which can be stored in, th in those data types and uh, also we need to know what amount of space they occupy under the hood and let's start with a byte and a byte occupy 8 bits right so a byte occupy bits and we say that a byte has a width of 8 and uh, a short can store a large uh, range of numbers and occupy 16 bits and has a width of 16. An int has a much larger range, as you know, and occupies 32 bits and has a width of 32. The point here that each data type occupies a different amount of memory. We can see that an int needs the four times the amount of space than a byte does, for example. It's not particularly relevant to you to know these numbers, but it come up as an interview question and it's useful to know that a certain type takes up uh, more space than others. All right, now let's close our project because I'm going to create a new project. Now I'm going to click here on new project because we have uh, our previous project here. All right. On the left hand side, again, Kotlin should be selected for the name. I'm going to call it, uh, it should be in Pascal case, float and double. All right, here is a rec for the BC system IntelliJ and for the project JDK, select uh, the JDK there. I'm going to click on next and I'm going to click on finish. Now our project is going to be created. Right, let's delete this code. We can keep uh, the args and the array string here. I'm going to keep it to see that there is no 
But there's not is not making any difference in our uh, in our code. I'm gonna delete the I'm gonna delete the print uh, ln statement, and I'm gonna expand this to the left because we don't really need the project pane. Actually, I'm gonna expand it full. It's not working full. I'm gonna then click here to hide the project pane. All right. Um, floating point numbers are used for storing numbers which have a fractional part, which have decimals. So floating point numbers are used when you need more precision in your uh, calculations. And you'll, as you will see in the next video, this uh, has uh, a practicality. Now, to declare a floating point number, just type val because I want this uh, variable to be immutable. I'm gonna call it uh, my number. Again, should be in camel case now. First letter, uh, first uh, word should start with a color case letter and the following words should start with capital letters. And for, th for the type I'm gonna choose, let's actually not choose uh, any type. Let's just put equals and try, try here to assign a value. Let's put 2.5. Okay, now if you hover over here and if you look at uh, what type this value has, what type this variable has, you can see that the type which was inferred is the double. So if we want to change the type, we can put here float, let's say to be a float. But look what happens when we do this. It says that the floating point literal does not conform to the city type float. And that is because, like uh, in, uh, in, our, in our example with the integer, the type which is inferred, which is automatically assumed by Kotlin, is double in this case. So even though we said here explicitly that we're going to store a, a float, because it types here a literal value, it considers this to be a double. So to solve this, you need to delete this from here and put here at the end of our number an F. Now, if I hover over here, now uh, the variable has the type float. So this is how you declare a float variable. You need to put a F at the end of uh, the number, a suffix. And uh, for, the, for declaring a double, you can just uh, type val, let's call it my second number equals, and if I put 2.5 here, 2.5, now if I hover, hover over here, like, in, uh, like I said previously, it automatically inferred the type to be a double. So if you don't specify, if you don't specify a type, the automatically infer type will it will be a double because this is the type which is uh, inferred uh, for the floating point numbers and uh, this is similar to the integer type because there we've seen that uh, the type which is automatically inferred is an int so here we have the same thing so this is how we can declare a floating point number and this is how we can uh, declare a double now, what is the difference between this? They differ in the, in the precision in uh, which uh, in the precision we they have, and we'll see in the next example in the next video. We're going to be talking about operators and operations. Uh, what is the what is the precision of a float and what is the precision of a double? And uh, float comes from a floating precision number, and uh, double comes from double precision number. And as the name implies. The, da the double uh, data type has a more has more precision in uh, our calculation and you'll see, you're gonna see an example of uh, this in the next uh, uh, video because we need to first learn about operators and operations before we we introduce any kind of operator here even though we we we've already used an operator which is the assignment operator which is this operator here but we're gonna talk about uh, this in the next video. So I'm going to end this video now and uh, see you in the next video. We're going to start our discussion about operators and also in that video we're going to see 
uh, that uh, the float has a smaller precision than the double and uh, the double is assumed to be it's assumed to be the default type because it has uh, a bigger precision so i'm gonna end this video now see you in the next video but before we end our video actually let's uh, print let's output those values in our console let's output the values of the variables in our console so i'm gonna type println statement below of our code below the declaration of our variables and inside the parentheses i'm gonna put a, a double pair of quotation marks i'm gonna type my number equals dollar sign to get the value the content of my number and my second number we put equals again dollar sign not here my second number now let's print those values in our console now as you can see output is 2.5 and 2.5 but if i hover over here you can see that the type for, for uh, because it's explicitly given here is the float and if i hover over here this is the double but let's see what happens if i delete the fractional part and i just actually you can uh, you can put a lowercase if lowercase f here or an uppercase f like this if you run this code again you'll have the same output again now let's uh, delete the fractional part and just let an f there and uh, here let's also delete the fractional part and let's uh, let's uh, run our code and uh, you may be know what is going to happen now it printed 2.0 for uh, my number because uh, we said explicitly here that this is a flow so it prints the fractional part but uh, in case in the case of my number it only outputted uh, two because now this is inferred if you hover over here as an int so one uh, solution to this may be to type here double and uh, try to see what happens and if I hover over this hover over here it says the integer in the li integer literal does not conform the expected type double and it's correct because this is assumed to be an int so you cannot uh, you cannot even though you said explicitly here that this is gonna store doubles here we put an int an integer value so if I delete the type here let's say if i try to put a d here actually there is no d for the double there is no like in the case of the float you know, if, even if i try to put a uppercase d there is no uh, way to add a suffix to our uh, variable the only way is to put directly here 2.0 and now this is uh, inferred as a double as you can see here and if I run this, now it output it 2.0 and 2.0 in both of our variables. All right, I'm going to end this video now and uh, see you in the next video. All right, so far in our course, we've only dealt with data types which can store numbers but there are two different data types which we're gonna look at in this video which you can use for storing a different type of data and we're gonna see what kind of data we can store but those data types are called the char data type and the boolean data type but first let's create our project let's create a new project i'm gonna give it a name i'm gonna call it char and boolean again it should be in pascal case Make sure for the build system that you select IntelliJ and make sure that you have the project JDK selected. So I'm going to click on next to create a project. I'm going to click on finish. Now a project is going to be created. On the left hand side you have the project pane. 
we have our code uh, auto generated for us even though this code uh, is gonna we're gonna delete this code which is inside the uh, curly braces because you don't need this code so i'm gonna delete this code and uh, let's also hide the project pane because you don't need the project pane and uh, let's see how uh, we can declare a char data type and uh, after that we're gonna talk about uh, how we where you can use the chart type in a specific case and what specific cases you can use so i'm going to type val because i want this variable to be immutable i don't want to change value value later i'm going to call it my char value again it should be in camel case and for the type i'm going to put colon i'm going to choose char press enter let's put equals and let's now assign a value to this uh, variable so this time we're gonna type a single pair of quotation marks not a double pair of quotation marks like we did in our uh, string data type and in a char data type we can store only a single sum symbol and that symbol can be a letter a number or an uh, exclamation point or mark so i'm gonna put here a d a single letter D and uh, you may be wondering now what is this what is a specific case when you can, where you can use a char value a specific case can be let's say if you want to store the last key pressed uh, by a user so this is a, a speci specific case where you can use the char data type now let's print this value in our console to see that uh, it should be in a lowercase letters print ln and uh, you can print it uh, by the usual way where we put here a double pair of quotation marks and we type a dollar sign and here we type the name of our variable match our value press enter i messed up the code let's delete this now if i run this the console will start in a short moment and you're going to see the output of the letter D. Right, so the console opened and now we have uh, output it down here, the letter D. So this is the usual way how oh, one uh, of uh, referring a variable. That, but you can refer the variable even uh, like this. By not putting the dollar sign deleted the dollar sign and also the the quotation mark at the beginning now if i run this it's gonna still output the letter d so we see that we have now also the letter d so this is another way of printing the value if in, in a in a variable but this uh, is not really the usual way to do it now uh, let's take a look at the next data type and that is the boolean data type and to declare a boolean data type we type again val because again I want this to be immutable and, and um, I'm gonna call it my in camel case should be boolean value and for the type choose boolean and a boolean a boolean data type can only store a true or a false or a false value so you can only assign here true or false so if you type uh, now let's uh, print those values but this time i'm gonna put uh, the parentheses and i'm gonna put the quotation marks i'm gonna type my char let's my char value equals dollar sign my char value and my let's type the name here boolean value equals and let's put the dollar sign my boolean value now if you run this code Now you can see that my char value, which is 
this text here has this value which is the content of this variable that we're referring here and uh, my boolean value which is our variable the name of our variable has the content of false so it printed here false now uh, boolean uh, data types the boolean data types are going to be used in our code a lot because um, the boolean uh, data types can be used for uh, controlling the flow of the program so you can uh, in you're going to see that in combination with the if statement with at which you're going to look at the, in the next video in the next videos uh, you can control you can actually control the flow of the program because uh, usually the flow of the program is from top to bottom and with the with uh, the boolean uh, data type and with an if statement as you'll see you can control uh, actually what you can control to you can control what parts of the code are uh, uh, compiled or not based on a certain condition if that condition is false or if that condition is true so boolean data types are going to be used as you'll see a lot in our uh, code and in your, in your uh, coding career as you'll see so these are the two data types that uh, can be used for storing either a single uh, character or a, or a, a character and uh, this is the data type which can be used for storing uh, true or false or which is called the boolean data type also you may saw already here that you can delete the types here because as we talked about Kotlin uh, has what is called the type inference so can it infer the type by looking um, at uh, what value we assign to it so in this case you know it knows that this is a type of char so here you know you can see that the type is a boolean all right but before we end our video let's do a little recap about uh, the eight data types that we looked at into throughout these videos and the eight data types are the byte short int and long those are for storing the whole numbers and the next two data types are the float and double for storing floating point numbers or numbers which have a fractional part decimals and the next two ones are the ones that we looked at in this video and those are the char and the boolean and uh, those data types are also call, called uh, primitive data types because uh, it has to do with uh, they are called like that because it has to do with how they are stored in memory and uh, a string data type is not uh, really a primitive data type because it store uh, it stored a little differently also yeah, as you're gonna see the string data type uh, has uh, special language support so you can consider these uh, eight primitive data types as the building blocks for data manipulation and in the next video we're gonna look at those at this data manipulation but by looking specifically at what operations we, we can do with, with uh, those uh, data types because in uh, throughout this, this video we only looked at how we can store values and how we can output this those values but in, uh, in a real in real app you'll need to to manipulate that data to add or to subtract something and we're gonna look at all of this in the next video see you next all right so far in our videos we only looked at how we can store different values in our variables how to output them to the console but uh, in a real app you'll need to do some mathematical calculations so in this video we're gonna learn about that we're gonna look at operators so first let's create a new project I'm gonna click on new project I'm gonna speed up the process now a little bit because we did this uh, already a few times so I'm gonna call it operators I'm gonna select IntelliJ click on next and click on finish now our project is gonna be created in a short moment again on the left hand side we have the project pane and we have the main fu function and the uh, code auto generated for us now we're gonna delete the code inside the curly braces inside the curly braces of main function because we don't need this code and also i'm gonna hide the project pane because i don't need the project pane and uh, first let's declare two variables i'm gonna declare the first variable as a var because i want to reassign this value later i'm gonna call it um, uh, let's say um, x 
and uh, in a real app you should use more descriptive names because uh, the name of the variable should say what the variable is doing anyway I'm gonna put equals I'm gonna assign a value of 5 and the next variable I'm gonna declare it as a val because I don't want to change uh, this value later I'm gonna call it i I'm gonna put a value of 3 here and next I'm gonna declare another variable this is gonna be also of the of val I'm gonna call it result and we're gonna store the sum of 5 and 3 here and to do that we type here x and this is the first operator that uh, we're gonna use, looked at, look at and that is the add or the plus operator so I'm gonna put here x plus i now let's print uh, this result I'm gonna type print ln I'm gonna put uh, double pair of quotation marks I'm gonna type result the text equals dollar sign to get the value of the variable here I'm gonna press enter to fill that suggestion for me and now let's run this code to see what is gonna output you're gonna see the output 8 here because 5 plus 3 is 8 the console sh should open in a short moment right so it outputted the result equals to 8 because 5 plus 3 is 8 now what we have differently here and we didn't uh, we didn't have uh, we didn't had previously is that now we're using a variable the variables here and we're not using uh, literals like we have here 5 and 3 type directly and um, um, it's important to to clarify some uh, names here and first is the name uh, operand an, op an operand is any object which, which is affected by an operator in our case the operands are x and i because those those variables are affected by the operator plus because it sums their values and then it puts these values in the variable result so those uh, two variables x and i I called operand also the if you had here uh, literal values if, if we put it here uh, let's say 5 and 3 directly these two are also called operands so literals or variables are called uh, operands any any object which, which is affected by an operator is called an operand because if you now if you now you're gonna see also 8 here but let's change this back to to i and x and uh, there is another way to to output uh, the value of x plus i by using a placeholder what is called a placeholder and to do that let's first delete this line of code and uh, this now is red because we don't have the variable uh, declared I'm gonna delete what is inside the quotation marks and gonna, I'm gonna type here x plus i the text equals and now I'm gonna put here I'm gonna put here dollar sign and I'm gonna put curly braces and inside the curly braces I'm gonna type let's uh, click here to make it clear x plus i so this is called the placeholder and uh, we can use this and in a placeholder we can only put uh, expressions and uh, an expression is a construct which evaluates to a single value so in our case x plus i evaluates to a single value because it returns the value 8 so uh, this is why uh, we can put here uh, x plus i and uh, even though if you, if you if you if you put something which uh, will not uh, be an expression here IntelliJ is gonna warn you and I'm gonna see uh, in the following uh, minutes um, an example of that now let's output this and you're gonna see the same result but now we have uh, the different uh, text here we're gonna have we're gonna have x plus i so now we have x plus i equals 8 which is uh, the correct result now let's uh, copy this four times and to do to, to make that easier we can uh, press ctrl d or command d on mac so i'm gonna press ctrl d four times now let's change this to minus because we're gonna look at the subtraction now 
here we're gonna look at I'm gonna look at the multiplication operator which is an asterisk operator so I need to put here inside the curly braces the asterisk because this is where uh, the expression is evaluated and uh, the next is the division so we're gonna put here a for forward slash so I'm gonna put here also forward slash forward slash right and uh, you know this uh, this uh, operators for a math class this one but uh, one that is not so well known outside the programming uh, is uh, it's uh, called the modulus operator and the modulus operator is the operator which um, gives us the reminder of a division so the modulus operator is uh, a percent and sign so put percent and sign here and percent and sign here right now if you run this code all right so now we have uh, the output down here and we have x plus i is 8 because 5 plus 3 is 8 x minus y is 2 because 5 minus uh, 3 is 2 x times y is 15 because 5 times 3 is 15 x divided by y and this is interesting is 1 but uh, because those variables are of type int they are inferred automatically to be of type int it dropped completely the fractional part here so you don't have here 1.6 or something you have uh, only the integer part which is 1 and uh, here we have the, the, the modulus operator and this gives us a remainder of uh, 5 divided by 3 which is 1 and uh, has a remainder of 2 now if you want to to have here the fractional part you need to declare uh, one of the variable uh, as a type as a floating point uh, number and that can be or, or either a float or a double so I'm going to declare the the i variable as a double so I'm going to put 3.0 here and now all the variables all the results here are going to be are going to be uh, are going to be uh, of type double so if you run this you're gonna see the fractional part for all the variables here now you can see now we have 8.0 2.0 15 and here we have 1.6666 and 7 now it shows also the fractional part and uh, for the reminder all we've, we've also have the fractional part here so um, now the type of the if you want the type of the expression is a double because we declare here as a double this variable i as a double and the next one is y then automatically you don't, you don't you don't need to declare also the x as a double it will be uh, if, you, if you want why then automatically by the fact that we declare the i variable as a double all right and uh, let's continue and often in programming you'll want to increase uh, a variable by a certain number and uh, to do that let's first uh, let's declare again the variable result down here let's uh, declare it as a var because I want to reassign it let's call it a result and let's put uh, again x plus i here now, if you want to increase, let's say, the, the value of this variable by 2, we can type something like result equals result. Let's say that I want to increase this variable by 2. I'm going to put result equals result plus 2. And um, this equals operator is different from uh, a mathematical equals because um, this uh, equal separator operator is not saying that result equals result plus two because that's in, it's incorrect what this equals operator is it's also called it's an assignment operator and what is doing is that it assigns first it adds two to our variable result and then it store stores that uh, that result that result of the that uh, expression in our variable result right 
So let's print uh, this value to see what we have here. So if I print this, you should see 10 here. Print LN, not print. I'm, uh, and I'm going to put here result equals dollar sign result. And if you run this code, you're going to see 10. Right, so you have 10, but let's uh, let's delete the, the fractional part here to have the type of the variable as integers. So let's run this code again. So now we have 10 here, result equals 10. And let's copy this code uh, again four times. Let's add a space. So now I messed up the code. And if you mess up the code like I did here, you can do, you can undo this thing by going to edit and click on undo paste or uh, the shortcut is uh, control Z and uh, you'll see the corresponding uh, shortcut uh, in a Mac here on the right. So please press here and now uh, our code is restored here as you can see. So let's copy this again. Let's press enter and let's paste this down. So one, two, three, four. All right, now let's change this, this one to minus. Let's change this to multiplication, which is the asterisk operator. Let's change this to division, which is the forward slash. And let's change this to modulus, which is the percent and sign. Now, if you run this code, let's run it from the top right, right hand side now. What you're going to see is that first we have 10 because of now uh, uh, the result has a value of 8 because x plus sign is 5 plus 3. We have 8. And now here we were adding two to our result, and then we print that value in that variable in our uh, in our console, and that is gonna output ten. The next we decrement that uh, variable by two, and we have eight. Next we multiply that uh, that uh, variable by two, so we have eight times two, which is sixteen, which is the result here. Next, we have a result divided by 2 and uh, 16 divided uh, by 2 is 8. So we have 8, eight here. Now, now we have result uh, modulus 2 and uh, 8 modulus 2 is 0 because 8 divided by, by 2 has no reminder, right? Next, you can see that we have all of those underlines here, and if you hover over one of them, it's going to say replaceable with operator assignment. So there is a shorter way to write the same thing that we have here, or uh, there is an abbreviation to write the same thing that we have here, and here, and here, and here, because they are so often used in uh, programming, they are, there is a abbreviation for all of them. So let's click on replace with plus and equals, replace with minus and equals, Replace with uh, multiplication and equals, with division and equals, and with modulus and equals here. All right, so this is the abbreviation of uh, what we had previously, of a shorter way, a shorter way to write the same thing. So if you run this code now, you're gonna see that it's gonna output the exact uh, values that we had uh, previously. So we have 10, 8, 16, 8 again, and 0. So this is a short way of uh, abbreviating, uh, or actually this is a way of abbreviating what we had previously because as I said they are very very often used in programming. What is... alright. Now, uh, another important thing to know is uh, operator precedence. So first let's type again 
a println statement and uh, I'm gonna put a double pair of quotation marks and inside the quotation marks I'm gonna put the text uh, 3 so this is the text 3 plus 3 times let's say um, 4 now also inside the quotation marks let's put a dollar let's put equals here the text and let's put a dollar sign here and now let's put curly braces and inside the curly braces I'm gonna put 3 plus 3 times 4 Let's click here to make it clear times four. Now, if you run this code, now you see that uh, it outputted 15 because uh, um, multiplication has precedence over addition. So it first multiplies 3 times 4 which is 12 and then it adds 3 to our uh, result so we have 15 but like in a math class you can control uh, which uh, expression is evaluated first by putting parentheses so if I put parentheses here now this will be evaluated first 3 plus 3 and then uh, it will multiply the result by 4 so if you run this code you're gonna see 3 plus 3 is 6 times 4 is 24 so you're gonna see 24 here now so you can see that uh, operators have precedence but you can control that precedence using parentheses uh, like you did here so multiplication and division have precedence over um, uh, additional and subtraction all right there are two other operators which can be used for increasing or decreasing the value of a variable exactly by one and uh, let's look at this uh, operator but first let's uh, use our variable x that we declare above and uh, let's assign a value of zero to it and uh, to use the increment and decrement operator this is how they are called let's use the println statement first to Let's put a double uh, pair of quotation marks here and uh, let's type x equals and let's put dollar sign and let's type here uh, x and to use the increment operator we type plus plus right and what this is gonna do is gonna increment the value of our variable which now is 0 by 1 and there is another way to increment the value of our variable by putting the increment operator or the plus plus operator in front of our variable not at the end of our variable so we can type again a println uh, down here let's put uh, quotation marks and I'm gonna put x equals and now I'm gonna put dollar sign plus plus x but the, uh, this now is not working because uh, dollar sign only works if you refer a variable so to do solve that we're gonna put this in a parenthesis actually in curly braces so let's put this in curly braces and let's put the above one also in curly braces not here all right, and uh, both of both of these increment uh, increment value of uh, x by one. They differ in what value they return. So the first first returns the value of x, which is zero, and then it increments it. And uh, the next uh, increment operator, which is before the name of the, the before the variable, it increments. The variable and then return its value so what you're gonna see if you output this code is gonna be interesting so if you output if you output this code let's bring it down you're gonna see 0 and 2 and you may be wondering how this makes any sense because you have incremented the value here and uh, that's 
that does this happens because this first returns the value of x so it returns the value of x and then it prints the value of x which is 0 and then it increments so now the x has the value of 1 when the next uh, println statement is executed now it or the variable x is incremented by 1 so it has a value of 1 and now it will be incremented again but it will also be returned not like in the previous uh, uh, increment operator which has the at uh, the end so now it will have the value of 2 okay and there is uh, the same operator is uh, avail available for uh, decrementing so if uh, if I want to decrement uh, a variable exactly by one I can put here x let's put equals let's put uh, curly braces actually the dollar sign curly braces and can put x minus minus and uh, let's print let's uh, call the printer and uh, function again we can put x equals dollar sign again curly braces and let's put now the decrement operator which is the minus minus in front of our uh, variable now you're gonna see something similar but in the inverse way. So now we have now we have two and zero, and uh, let's explain uh, this also. So again, this uh, print length statement is executed. Now the x has the value two, and uh, it returns two, and then it decrements. So it prints the value of two, and then it decrements the value. Of of uh, our variable x by 1. So now we have 1. When the next println uh, statement is executed or function is called, now the value is 1 so and it first decrements the value and then it returns the, va the, 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 the value of the variable. So now we have 0 because it was decremented. This is why we have uh, 0 and 2 and 2 and 0 here. Alright? So you see above here that I declare the variable as a var so I can uh, reassign this value down here to zero. Right, this is our discussion about operators. There are more operators but in order to talk about uh, the next operators we need to first talk about uh, an if statement. So now it's time to look at comments and comments are nodes that you can add to your code and uh, they are uh, ignored by the compiler. And usually they are, they are used when you want to add some uh, description about the code. So what uh, you want to indicate what the code is doing because you may roll uh, some code and you come to that code a few e weeks later and forgot what it's doing. And by putting comments you can, uh, you can see specifically what that code is doing. And when, in Kotlin we have two types of comments. The first is so-called end of line comment. And uh, to add an end of line comment we put two slashes. And here we put uh, our comment. Let's say here we are doing op operations. So this is an end of line comment, and this is uh, a text which simply says here we are doing operations. And this is, uh, as I said, an end of line comment. The next comment that you can use is so called the block comment. And to use a block comment, we put slash asterisk and uh, now you can press enter or uh, you can uh, put uh, asterisk and slash to add to, to add the the, the next uh, to, to close this uh, comment and you press enter and as you can see it added automatically this uh, asterisk and slash or uh, you can type this yourself and here you can put some text which can be some uh, it, it, it can be something which uh, is going to say what the code is doing. So, so those are the two types of comments that you can use in Kotlin. The end of line comment and uh, the, block, the block comment. And you can also use comments to disable some code. So if I put two slashes here, now that line of code is going to be ignored by the compiler. So this is our discussion about comments. See you in the next video. Alright, before we continue the discussion about operators, let's first introduce the if-then-else statement. And uh, let's first start talking about how usually our code is executed. And usually our code is executed from top to bottom. And that means that uh, our code is executed line, line by line. 
and uh, that is the flow of the program. But uh, with an if-then-else statement, you can break the flow of the program by imposing a condition. And uh, you can say to the computer to execute a particular section of code only if a condition is true. So let's see how we can do that. So let's first declare a variable. I'm going to type val. This is going to be immutable. I'm not going to reassign its value. I'm going to call it its active and I'm going to put equals and I'm going to assign a value of true to it. So it's going to be of type boolean. On the next line, I'm going to type the if keyword and now IntelliJ is giving us some hints here. I'm going to press enter and inside the parentheses, we, we put our condition. So here I'm going to type is active, the variable. And now I'm going to type equals equals. Notice that here now we have two equals. And here we type true. Next, we put a left curly brace. And now you can uh, add the right curly brace or you can press uh, you can press enter and the right curly brace is going to be added automatically by IntelliJ uh, for you. So if I press enter now, you can see that on the line uh, 40 we the right curly brace was added automatically now let's type here a println a statement so i'm going to type println press enter and quotation marks and here we're going to type the text the user is active right and uh, if you run this code let's see what happens And we get the output the user is active which is the text that we typed here and uh, let's first uh, talk to, uh, let's first uh, talk about what we have here and uh, the if statement checks to see as i said to see if this condition inside the parentheses is true this if this expression returns true and uh, it, it does that by checking to see if the operands are identical or if they are the same so it checks to see if the content of the variable it's acted which is uh, true it's equal to true and that is that sounds confusing but it's true because uh, our variable it's active has a value of true and here we're checking to see if our uh, if those two are equal or if they are the same and that is true and this expression returns true and uh, in effect the code inside the curly braces is executed. But if I change this to false, so if I change this value and if I run this code now, this condition inside the parentheses is going to be false and the code is not going to be executed. So you can see now that we don't see any output because this condition is false and uh, because the condition is false, the code inside the curly braces is not going to be executed. But uh, if you want to cover the part where the condition is false, so if you want to execute some code even though con the condition is false, you can type here else. And here you also need to put uh, curly braces. So I'm going to put uh, the left curly brace. I'm going to press enter. And the right curly brace was add added automatically for me. Now I'm going to type println. And inside the parentheses, I'm going to put... Uh, the user is not active. So now what is going to happen is that this condition is going to fail, it's going to be false because the two operands are not equal, respectively is active and true. And uh, it's going to be executed the else part in this case. It's going to be executed the code which is inside the curly braces of the else. So if you run this code, you're going to see the output, the user is not active. So as, as you can see, now it says the user is not active because this condition was uh, false. This returns, this boolean expression returns false and uh, it jumps to the else part. So this is how we can uh, use the else uh, part. Now, what we can also do is to add another if statement below of our uh, if statement to chain more if statements, to check for more conditions. But to do that, we need to use uh, another uh, operator which is the called the greater than operator which is an operator which you may know from your uh, math class and uh, to do that let's change first the variable so i'm going to type uh, here a value of 100 to make it an integer 
and uh, also I'm going to change its name and to change the name of the variable go right click on the variable go to rename to refactor and go to rename and now uh, if you change the name of the variable here is going to be change everywhere where the variable is called so if I look what, what happens if I delete the name here it's changed also on the line 38 where we're referring the variable and now, now I'm going to call the variable my number and I'm going to press enter now the name of the variable it's updated and now this condition is not correct here we need to put a greater than sign so I'm going to put a greater than sign and let's check for uh, let's say if my number is greater than 150 and this is false now because my number has a value of 100 so this is going to evaluate to false this condition this expression now let's add here another if state if statement so we're going to put here else if and inside the parenthesis we're going to put the condition and uh, now i'm going to type uh, again my number my variable our variable now here we're going to put uh, let's say uh, Uh, greater than 90 now this condition is true so let's add also the curly braces because we need uh, we need uh, to put our code inside there let's put here uh, a println also let's type here uh, greater than 90 and here let's also change the test to greater than 150 and here you can put uh, all the conditions Here you can put all the condition failed because the else part is going to be executed only if all the condition that we have here which is uh, for that my number is greater than uh, 150 and this is false my number is has a value of 100 and if uh, our else if condition also evaluates to false only then the else part is going to be executed so let's uh, run our code to see what uh, what if um, statement is going to be executed what part so you can see that we now get we get greater than 90 and that means that this condition is true because it's true that um, my number has a value of 100 and it checks to see if my number is greater than 90 which is true so it executes the code which is inside the else if part right now the next uh, operator that you can use is greater than or equal to so you can put here greater than or equal now what is gonna check to see is to is that it, what is gonna check is to see if the number that we're comparing to respectively my number is greater than 100 or equal to greater than 150 or equal to 150 so let's change this to let's say um, um, 149 so look what happens now So now it's executed the this part, the else if part, because this is greater, the number greater than uh, 90. But uh, if I put here greater, let's change the value of my number to uh, 150 to see what happens. And now we get the output greater than 150. And this is correct because now this condition is true. My number is greater than equals to 150. And uh, my number has the value of 150. It's not greater than 150, but it's 
greater than or equal to so it's equal to 150 so now this condition is uh, satisfied and the code inside the this curly brace is, uh, is executed which is greater than 150 all right now i'm gonna end this video and in the next video video we're gonna continue our uh, discussion about uh, those operators all right so now let's continue our discussion about the next operators that you can use in kotlin and let's start with the less than operator and uh, to do that let's first change the value of uh, the variable my number to 100 and to use the less than operator you we put here a less than sign which you probably know from uh, your math class now if you run this code i should change here the text to make it uh, consistent let's type here uh, So now if you run this, now get the output less than 150. And this is true because the value of the variable my number is less than 150. So this condition now evaluates to true. The next operator that you can use is less than or equal to, similar to greater than or equal to operator. And to use the less than or equal to operator, we put here a less sign and the equal sign, right? And let's change the value here to 150 to make it clear. Now, let's change also the, vo the value of uh, the variable to 150. And let's also change the text here. Now, if you run this code, you're going to see the output less than or equal to 150 because now the else if part and the condition of the else if statement evaluates to true because now the the value of uh, my number it's not the, it's not less than 150 because it's 150 but it's less than or equal to 150 so this condition evaluates to true All right the next uh, operator that you can use is called the logical not equal operator and that operator is used to check if two operands respectively if to if my number let's say or and 150 are not the same and let's see how we can do that and to do that to type here uh, an exclamation mark and an equal sign and this operator here which is the exclamation mark is gonna check to see if those two operands respectively my number and 150 are not the same and only then the condition is going to evaluate to true so let's run this code to see what happens so now we get the output less than or equal to 150 because we still have the value 150 so it jumps to the lc part but if I change this to, let's say, 100, now look what happens. Now it executes the if, now this condition evaluates to true because now this operator is checking to see if the two operands, if the value of uh, my number, the value of my number is not equal to 150 and that is true they are not equal and this is why you get here the output but let's change the output to make it uh, clear let's type here uh, they are not equal so if you run this code you're gonna see the output they are not equal because that condition now evaluates to true so this is how you can use the logical not equal operator also with the logical not operator we can change the value for boolean expression from true to false and from uh, false to true in other words you can negate its value and to do that let's first declare the code that we had previously so i'm going to declare again the val variable it's active i'm going to assign a value of uh, true i'm going to type the if statement again i'm going to put the same condition equals equals true so 
Here you can put the left curly brace and press enter or can add the, the, curly, the right curly brace if you want, but it will be added automatically for you. I'm gonna type else, also the left curly brace, press enter. I'm gonna put the text that we had previously. Alright, now if you run this code, you're gonna see the output, uh, the user's active because this is gonna evaluate to show they are uh, equal, they're the same. Let's expand this. So you see the output of the user is active because this condition evaluates to show. And before we look at the logical NOT operator, how we can negate the value, let's first see how we can write the same expression that we have here in a shorter way by abbreviating. So because you have noticed probably that we have an un underline here. And if you hover over here, it says that the Boolean expression can be simplified. So let's click here, simplify Boolean expression to see what happens. So now we get if it's active and uh, then print, uh, and then execute the code uh, inside the curly braces. So this thing now does the exact same thing that we did previously. It's, so it checks to see if the value of uh, it's active is equal to true. So it's a shorter way of writing the same thing. And uh, now get the output, uh, the user's active. But with the equal not operator, you can put the exclamation uh, mark in front of our uh, it's active uh, exp expression and it's now now it's going to negate its value now it's going to change its value from true to false so now if you run this code now you're going to see the output the user is not active because now this uh, logical not operator switch is switching its value to false. So now this is going to be, this will evaluate to false and it's going to execute the else part that we have with the user is not active. And you can do the same for uh, false. So if you put here false, now let's actually execute this without the logical not operator to see what happens. Now this will not execute, so it will execute the else part. So you see the user is not active, but if I put the logical not operator in front of it's active, now it's going to change its value from false to true. And now this will evaluate to true and it, exe it will execute the uh, code inside the curly brace of the if. So now you see that it says the user is active. So this is how you can use the logical not operator to flip a value from false to true or from true to false. And you can do this for, for every Boolean expression that you use. So we can put the logical not operator in front of this. Actually not in front of this. Um, you can put the logical not operator generally speaking in front of any Boolean expression. Right? So this is our discussion about uh, operators. So in the next video we're going to look how we can com combine multiple expression to create a bigger expression which itself returns a true or a false value. See you in the next. Alright, so I deleted the code that we had previously. You can uh, keep the code that we had previously if you want, but I deleted it to make uh, things more clear. And in this video, we're going to look at how we can combine multiple expressions, which in themselves can return a Boolean uh, value, which can be either true or false. And uh, let's start with the first uh, operator, which is called the logical end operator. But let's first declare two variables. I'm going to declare a val variable. I'm going to call it uh, it's playing. I'm going to assign a value of true to it, so it's going to be of type boolean. And uh, on the next line, I'm going to declare another variable, also a val, and it's going to be called score, and it's going to have a value of uh, 80. Now, down here we type if, and inside the parenthesis we type is playing equals equals true. So this is the equals to operator. Uh, I didn't, didn't uh, talk really a lot about the equals to operator, but the equals to operator uh, checks to see if the two operands are uh, the same. So it, uh, in contrast to the one equal operator, the one equal operator assigns what's on the right to, to our uh, variable, which is on uh, the left. So in this case, assign true to our variable is playing, so or it's assign 80 to our variable uh, score. The equals the two equals or the equals to operator is different because it checks to see if uh, 
what you have on the left or what you have on the left in, in and on the right are the same or are identical next uh, and we know from the previous video that we can abbreviate this we can write this in a shorter uh, way by putting just is playing so this will be this is going to be equivalent to what we had previously because as you can see it says that you can simplify the Boolean expression and now gonna use the logical end operator and use the logic logical end operator we type two ampersand signs and here we type score now we're gonna use again the equals uh, equals operator this time we need to use it there is not a short uh, way to check for uh, and we type if score equals to 100 All right so this expression inside the parenthesis is gonna evaluate to true only if both expressions respectively is playing and score equals equals to 100 evaluates to true so only if those two conditions are true only then the code inside the parentheses inside the curly braces actually is going to be executed so let's say that in a real app here you can add the logic to open the next level but uh, here we go just going to output some text so i'm going to type here uh, next level opened right and also i'm gonna add the else part here and here gonna put uh, also print ln statement and inside the parentheses is gonna type still at the same level now if you run this code you're gonna see the output still at the same level because not uh, those conditions are not both true is playing is uh, true but uh, it's playing is equal to true but uh, our score is not equal to 100 so this is going to evol evaluate to false and the entire ex expression inside the parenthesis is going to return false so it's going to execute the else part now if we change uh, our ver the, ver the value of our variable score to 100 now both expressions are true is playing equals to true and score and uh, the score is equal to 100 so now both of our expression are true and gonna see the text next level opened and now you see that it output the next level opened so this is the logical end operator and uh, you're gonna be using uh, the logical end operator a lot in your uh, code all right so now it's time to continue our discussion about operators and gonna look at the next operator which can be used to combine uh, multiple expression and that is the logical or operator and the lo log logical or operator evaluates an expression or multiple expression in this case to true if one of the condition is true or if both condition are true so let's see an example of this but first let's comment the code that we have here because it will make uh, things confusing so go to code and select comment with light comment with line comment or uh, you can press the, the shortcut control uh, slash now let's declare two variables down here the first uh, there the first is going to be a val i'm going to call it uh, num1 i'm going to assign a value of 5 to it second is going to be also a val it's going to be called num2 and i'm going to assign a value of uh, 3 to it or 4 now I'm going to type the if then else statement, I'm going to type the if keyword, inside the parentheses I'm going to put the condition, first is if num1 is greater than 0, and now to use the logical or operator we type two vertical bars here. Now we put our next uh, condition or our next expression, and that if num2 is also greater than 0, and we put a curly brace, press enter to, to add the right curly brace, and we put also the else part and inside the curly braces of the if let's uh, print some text let's say the condition is true all right now if you run this code You're gonna see the output the condition is true because now both conditions are true and uh, the logical operator 
returns true if both conditions are true or if one uh, of the condition is true. So let's see if we change this to minus 3. And now our second condition num2 greater than 0 is false. So now this is go also going to evaluate to true because the uh, logical or operator returns true if uh, one, at if one uh, of the conditions is true or if both conditions are true. So you now get condition is true. But if you change this to also to minus 5, now our both, both conditions are false. Now you're going to see that uh, it's going to be executed the else part because this condition now is going to be false because both conditions, both expressions, num1 greater than 0 and num2 greater than 0 are false. Alright, so let's change it back to 5. Now if you run this code, you're going to see the condition is true because at least one of the condition is true, which is this one, num1 greater than 0, even though the num2 condition is false. Alright, and this is how you can use the logical OR operator. Alright, now it's time to see how you can use the if then else statement as an expression. And that means that uh, the if then else statement can return a value which can be stored in a variable. So let's see how can you can do that. But first, uh, actually let's keep this code that we have here. And uh, to use the if then else statement as an expression, we declare a, um, a variable first. So I'm going to declare a val. And let's give it a name and we'll call it, uh, let's say, text. And to use the if then else statement as an expression, we put equals. And after the equals, we put our if then else statement. Now, we need to assign a value to our variable text to use it as, a, as an expression. And the value is going to be the last expression in the, in the curly braces. So here, if I type the text, let's say uh, this uh, is text one. And down here, if I type in quotation marks, this is text two. Now, if I add a println here at the end, and if I print the value of the variable text that we declare above, let's put a dollar sign. And if I type text here, now you can see our variable. It says that it's of type string. So if I run this code now, you're going to see first this println inside the curly braces, which says the condition is true. And uh, after that, you're going to see this text being assigned to our variable text, and uh, it will be output, out, output it down here by the println statement. So you see, this is text uh, 2. Actually, I was wrong. That condition is false because uh, here we have minus 5 and minus 3, and this condition is to false. And uh, the last, the last uh, expression in the, in the curly braces is assigned as a value to our variable. Now, um uh, what you can also do is to remove the curly braces but uh, it's recommended to use to not uh, use the curly braces if you have one only one statement uh, in your uh, if then else statement so let's del delete the println uh, here let's delete the curly brace here let's also delete the curly brace here let's delete the println statement here and let's also delete the curly brace here so now this will work the same, uh, it will work like previously, but uh, so now you'll see the same uh, output without the condition, without this text, the condition is false because now we don't have uh, the print and statement. So now we get this is text too because this condition evaluates to false and it assigns this value to our variable text, then down here it prints it. So also you see that this, uh, they are not aligned here, this our variable, and to format your code, you just go to code and uh, click reform, reformat code or press control alt l on windows or you can um, use another shot you can use the corresponding shortcut on uh, linux or mac so click on code and now we're gonna see that uh, our code is formatted if you run this now see this is text too but let's change this to five now this condition will evaluate to true and this expression is gonna be is gonna be assigned to our variable text. So if we run this you 
you know, see this now our variable text is assigned the value of this is text one because this condition is true and assign this value. To make things more clear, clear you can uh, use uh, you can uh, you can uh, type your code something like this. Now this does the exact same the exact same thing as previously. So if you run this code now. You're gonna see that now this it says the same thing. This is text one. Now, you may be wondering what type this variable is. So if you hover over it, it says that uh, it is of type string. But look, uh, what can I do? I can put here a number. So if this condition evaluates to false, this is gonna be assigned to our variable test. So if I run this now. Now get this text one, and let's uh, put here minus five for the condition to be false. And if you run this code now, now you're gonna see five. And you may be wondering how this uh, makes any sense because uh, previously our variable was of type string. But if you hover over here, now it says val text, and the type is uh, this thing comparable uh, anyway. Um, but what is uh, simply doing here is looking at the condition. It's looking first at the if statement. And uh, if this condition is true, then it assigns our text to our variable and then it infers the type to be a string, right? If this condition is false, then this part is skipped and then it assigns this value of five to our variable text. And, now, and then uh, our uh, variable is gonna be of type int. So there is no case in which uh, both uh, both uh, values going to be assigned to our variable. So this is why you can uh, use here text and here uh, an integer even though but if you declare explicitly here that this variable is going to store only strings, only sequence of characters or text, now here you'll get an warning because it says the integer literal does not conform to the expected type stream. So in other words, we cannot put here uh, uh, a number because we said that explicitly here that this is going to store only strings. But if you omit the type, that is going to work. So you can decide on what, uh, depending on the context, what to choose. So this way of uh, writing the if then else statement in one single line like we have here, it's okay as long as we use the if then else statement as an expression, or in other words, if you're assigning. Um, a value to a variable, like in our case. But if you have multiple instruction in your, uh, also if you have a single single instruction, you, you can also omit the curly braces. But um, most of the time, it's recommended to use the curly braces because that allows uh, that allows us to uh, execute more than on uh, uh, instruction or the statement in your code, and uh, it also makes the code uh, more clear. So let's change this code. Uh, from an expression to just an if then else statement to see why. So I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna add the curly braces. Let's format the code. Press Control uh, Alt L. All right. And also let's change this. Let's delete this. Uh, text. Let's add two println uh, statements here. All right. Now if you run this code, you're gonna see this part execute the else part because this condition is false. Both uh, of our condition respectively num1 great, is not greater than zero and uh, also num2 is also not greater than zero. So this is gonna return false and it's going to execute the else part. All right, but now if you change this to five, and now one of the conditions is going to be true, and uh, as you know, this entire expression is going, to wait, is going to evaluate to true now because at least one of the, the expression is true. So if you run this code,
Now I see this condition is true and also we see our, uh, our second print LN statement, this condition is true and some text. But um, look what happens uh, if I, uh, let's say, if I uh, delete the else part, right? And if I delete the curly braces here, all right? And now if I run this code, You see, the now both uh, statements are executed, but as I said, if you don't use curly braces, which won just only one of the uh, statements in is going to be executed. So why you have uh, both of these? Because the first is execu executed as part of the if uh, statement, because this condition is true, and the next one is executed because it's part of the code, because it's read from top to bottom. But if uh, I uh, change this to false, and now I want both condition, both uh, statements, uh, respectively with this one and this one, to not be executed, look what happens. Now get this condition is written some text. So the first uh, instruction in our if uh, then statement is omitted because it's part of the if then statement, but the second one it's uh, executed because it's part of the code, so it's going to be read. Uh, uh, anyway, so this is why you need to always use curly braces. In this way, the entire code is, also, is gonna be either executed or uh, omitted. So this is our discussion about the if then else statement, and uh, you should always use the curly braces. And uh, for the else uh, part, you also you should use the curly braces, and uh, only omit the curly braces if you have, if you have only single uh, one single. Ex uh, statement or uh, one single expression you, if you want to use uh, the if then else statement as an expression to assign a value to a variable but if you have just one single uh, statement let's say you have something like this you can omit the curly braces like this so now you can see that everything works uh, fine so you can use it uh, like this, if you have one single statement, like we have here, you just print some text to our console, or if you use it as an expression, so if you store a, a value in a variable. So see you in the next video. Alright, now it's time to look at the next control flow statement that we can use in uh, Kotlin besides the, the if then else statement and that is the when statement or the when expression but first let's create a new project I'm gonna call it control flow it should be in Pascal case select IntelliJ click on next and finish right now let's delete the code inside the curly braces let's hide the project pane and uh, let's first declare a variable, it's going to be a val, it's going to be called alarm, and I'm going to assign uh, a value of uh, 12 to it. Now, to, to declare a when statement, we type here when, we put parentheses, and inside the parentheses we put our argument, in this case it's our variable alarm. Next put space and we put the curly braces press enter and now we put the expression here so here I'm gonna put uh, the value let's say 12 now I'm gonna put a minus sign and a greater than sign so we have this arrow and uh, here I'm gonna type print ln this is the code that is gonna be executed and I'm gonna type the time is dollar sign alarm let's press ctrl D to duplicate this two times or three times and uh, let's change the last one to, to an else all right Let's change those values here to 7 and 14. 
Now let's run this code to see what to get in the output and uh, after that we're going to discuss our code. So we get in the output the time is 12 and uh, we get that because what is what the when statement is doing it's using this argument that we passed here in this case is our variable called alarm and it's comparing this uh, the value of this uh, argument with all the branches that we have here respectively it's going to compare it with uh, the expression that we have on the left because on the left we have the expression the this arrow sign is going to is is uh, saying execute execute this code on the right if this expression on the left is true in uh, this case if our ala alarm equals equals 12 and it's true we have uh, a value of 12 so this branch is executed and it executes the code uh, on the right which is this this the alarm is uh, 12 but if i change this to 7 now And if I run this code, now you're gonna see the time is seven. And if I change this to, let's say, 13, and here we have no 13, the else part is gonna be executed, similar to our uh, if then else statement. And we get the time is 13. So it was, it was executed, uh, else part now now and we can combine uh, those uh, expressions by putting a colon and and we can combine them and putting them on on one single line so i can uh, put here colon i can type here seven and 14. now i'm gonna delete those two now it will check to see if our uh, alarm argument has the value either 12 or 7 or 14. So um, let's change it to 14 to see. So now if you run this code, you're going to see that uh, this will uh, evaluate to true and this code on the right is going to be executed. So now again, the, the time is 14. And if I change this to 7, Again, this will evaluate true because one of those uh, expression is true. So we get the time is seven. All right. N what you can do next is we can check to see if a number is in a certain range. So we can put another uh, another expression here, and and here I can type in and the in keyword is used to check to see if a uh, number is to see if a number is in a certain range and to declare a range we type the range let's say that i want to check uh, from uh, let's say uh, 1 to, to to from 1 to 10 we put two dots dot dot 10 now what this is going to do is going to check to see if our uh, alarm argument and in this in this case our alarm variable is in the range from 1 to 10 now i'm going to put a minus sign and a great uh, and a greater than sign to have the arrow and here i'm going to type uh, the code that i want to be executed in this case it's just a print and statement and i'm going to type uh, the number is in the range one seven. Now, if you run this, let's run it from here. We get the time is seven because uh, the first branch is uh, checked and this branch is true. And uh, in effect, it executes the code on the right and uh, the next branches are uh, left off, are not executed. To, and to change that, let's put this first. So let's copy this. Now if you run this code, now get the number is in range 1 to 10. And it's true, our 7 is in the range from 1 to 10. What you can do is also you can use the logical NOT operator. So you can put here the logical NOT operator, which is an uh, exclamation mark. And this now will negate this value. So if you run this code now, you'll get the output uh, 7. The, the time is 7. So now you get the output 
the time is 7 because this uh, this switches this value from true to false and executes this uh, part now let's delete this what we can also do is that we can put curly braces so i can put curly braces press enter the same here and here also and it's recommended to use the curly braces only if you have multiple statements in your code in our case we have only one single statement which is this println which outputs uh, some text to the console and uh, the uh, when statement as i said can be used as an expression so i can type here a val let's say uh, text and i can assign the when expression to our uh, text variable now we need to give back uh, a value to our uh, text so instead of printing this text i can uh, delete this let's put it like this now the last expression in our uh, block of code which is uh, now we have a single expression but if you have multiple expressions say that we have here uh, another println let's say some text so similar to our if then else expression the last line of code the last expression is going to be assigned to our variable text now let's print this down here our console so let's type println and let's put directly here text now if you run this code now you're gonna see the text the number is in the range 1 to 10 because it checks to see if uh, this uh, expression on the left is true then it executes the, the code inside the curly braces, it, which is uh, this expression. And because now we're using the when as an expression, it assigns this expression, this text or variable text. Then it outputs that value with the println down here in our console. So we get the number is in the range 1 to 10. All right. Now, uh, but what if I want to put here... Uh, a less than sign so you, you, what if i want to put here if uh, it's less than seven our uh, alarm argument i can do that the only way to do that is by uh, let's delete this now let's put seven not here let's press ctrl alt l to format the code all right now, the only way to put a greater than sign or a less than sign or a greater than equal or greater or a less than equal sign is to delete the argument here. But let's first delete the curly braces to make uh, things more clear. So let's delete the curly braces. Let's delete this now because here uh, we have two lines of code, so we need to use curly braces. This is why I deleted the printer in there. And again, you should always use curly braces if you have multiple lines of code. But in our case, we have a simple line of code, which is uh, the text on the right, which is going to be assigned to our uh, variable text, and it's going to be output in the console. So always use curly braces if you have multiple lines of code. All right, all right. Now this is more concise and uh, more clear. And let's say that I want to check to see if uh, our alarm is less than, uh, say, uh, 10. Uh, to do that, we need to delete the argument here. All right. And now what can I do is I can put here our uh, alarm variable and here I can put less than or equal to 10. So now here we have a boolean expression on the left. Sorry. So now we have a boolean expression here on the left and this will check to see if our uh, alarm, our variable alarm, alarm has a value which is less than or equal to 10, which is true, we have a 7 here. So now if you run this code, uh, but uh, let's delete this because uh, we need to have uh, 
now boolean expression here because here we, we cannot uh, here we have uh, just literal types so here i need to put uh, let's say if uh, let's type alarm uh, equals equals eight or two vertical bars alarm equals equals seven so now if you run this code now you get the output the numbers in the range one to ten because now this on the this expression on the left is true and it executes this text uh, it assigns this expression to our variable text and it prints down here the that value so we get here the number is in the range one to ten but uh, this condition is also true so if i s s swap those two so if i put this one below because as i said if one uh, one of the expression evaluates to true the next uh, ones the the one which are below so this in this case this one is true are not be are not going to be executed are uh, skipped it only executes uh, this code and uh, the subsequent ones are uh, omitted so let's put this below it's good to remember this so now if you run this code now get the time is seven because now this evaluates true even though this below is also true because our uh, uh, alarm is uh, less than seven but because this evalu evaluates to true it executes the code which is on the right which is uh, assigning this uh, expression to our text and then it leaves the one expression it's not going uh, down to execute the next one so it breaks uh, right there and it stops it actually stops right there and it's not executing uh, the next branch so this is our discussion about the when uh, statement statement and the when expression see you in the next video now it's time to start a discussion about nullability in Kotlin. But first I'm gonna create a new project. I'm gonna call it null. Make sure to have the language Kotlin selected and for the build system IntelliJ. Also make sure to have the JDK selected here. And I'm gonna check this little box to generate the main function for us and that code that comes with the main function. So I'm gonna click on create to create a new project. Now our project is gonna be created in a short moment. So we got our uh, project created and we get our, our, we got our main function uh, auto generated here for us because we checked that box. So I'm gonna delete this because I don't need this code. And I'm gonna hide the project pane. So what is a null value? A null value is basically when you assign to a variable nothing. Syntactically speaking, you assign null to it, but what that means is that you have a variable which has no value, which has no memory reference. And if you try to do some arithmetic operation with that variable, you'll get in an impossible scenario where you have nothing trying to do some work and that will, will throw a, a null pointer exception. And this is particularly bad because uh, null, the null pointer uh, exceptions are only thrown at runtime and not at compile time. So you could have uh, your program working well and uh, having no problems. And uh, at some point you try to, I don't know, press a button and somehow, somehow that uh, pressing of the button is... Uh, using that variable which has a null value and then it's going to throw a null, po null pointer exception and uh, your app will crash and Kotlin aims to avoid uh, and to eliminate null pointer exceptions and null values that is not to say that we can't have a null value in a Kotlin but it's very hard to have uh, one so let's see why so what Kotlin has done to make uh, null values and implicitly null pointer exceptions very hard to get, it first made all its types by default non-nullable. And that means that you cannot assign uh, null to it. So if I declare here a variable called text, I'm going to declare the type explicitly. So it's going to be a string. And if I assign null, so to assign null to a variable, just type the null and we have the null keyword. We can't because this variable by default and all the variables by default are non-nullable and that means that you cannot assign a value. So if you hover over this underline it says null cannot be a value of a non-null type string. But 
what if I want to assign uh, null to it? What if, if I want to have null for some reason? In that case, you go at the end of the type and you put question mark. And that means that now you have a nullable type. That means that you can assign null to this uh, variable. So if I put question mark here, now I can assign uh, null to this variable. So this is uh, how we can assign null to a variable by putting the question mark at the end of the type. Because that is saying to the compiler, hey, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let me to assign null to this variable. So to avoid the, that uh, underline in red. Now, if I try to print this, so if I put here print line and I put here text, what do you think we'll get in the output? And the output get null. You know, you don't get null pointer exception. So now, if I hide this. And uh, let's say that I want to get the length of, uh, let's say, of the text. So let's say that uh, I assign here uh, some text. Well, actually, let's put a name here. Name. And, let's, and uh, if I try to get the length here, so if I put here that length I have an underline which says only safe and we have this question mark that or non null or asserted uh, and we have this uh, this operator calls are allowed on a nullable receiver of type string so it's saying that we, we can uh, we can only get because you, this this variable can have a null value but we know that it doesn't but the compiler is saying to us, uh, because we said that this can have null, is saying to check first that this variable is not equal to null and then try to get its length. And let's do that in the long way first. So let's delete this. So let's actually just copy this. And we type if, we put parenthesis, if text not equal to null then we're gonna output this then we're gonna get its length so we're gonna type here text that length so now the compiler is happy because it's it's uh, it's ensured that it's not gonna have null because we checked here especially that this variable uh, should have uh, you should not have null in order to get the length so now if I run this, I get four. So this is the length. So we have four uh, letters here. And I, I can also add the else part, which is, which is gonna say the variable is null. So if the variable is null, the else part is gonna be called. So now if you run this, We'll get also four, but I'm gonna assign, I'm gonna reassign this variable, so I'm gonna change it to var first. So we put here var, and put here text equals null. So now our variable is null, and this uh, check is gonna fail, and, and it's gonna execute the else part. So if I run this code, so we get the variable is null because now on the on the third line we assign null to it so this uh, if fails and is executed the else part but as you can see it's a lot of code just to check to to check and imagine if you have uh, multiple variables to check to to always check for this uh, to, 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 that the variable is not null then print its length and there is a shorter way in kotlin to do that and uh, we saw as a suggestion how to do that uh, previously so if i press ctrl z to uh, undo our code so if i press still pressing now if i hover over this error that we had previously which says only safe call so and you have this uh, operator and this is called the safe call operator and if i put here just a question mark this is equivalent to having a if which is checking to see if the length is null. If, and if the length is uh, null, then it's gonna say null. 
or and if it's not null it's gonna just output uh, 4 so now if i run this so this is equivalent to the if uh, that if the 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 if statement that we had previously so we have 4 so but if i sh and if i assign null so if i type here uh, let's change it to var the first so if i assign here text equals null we'll simply get null we get null but what if i want to get that uh, null pointer exception for whatever reason what can i do also the compiler uh, or it helping is helping uh, us also there so because if i delete that safe call operator which is just a question mark that and that is basically saying hey if this text is not null then output in the console uh, then get then get the length and then output that in the console if it's null just say null so this is how the safe call operator works but if i delete this as you can see there is another operator and is and uh, is this operator which is uh, two exclamation uh, marks and this operator is basically saying hey if uh, this variable has null then throw that exception but uh, if uh, it's not null just output uh, just output the length so if i put two exclamation marks here but for whatever reason it's not uh, the our text that length is not getting the length and i think this this is because we assign uh, to our text uh, variable here null it um, it can't uh, it has a prob it has a, prob a problem uh, with inferring uh, what type this variable is even though here is saying that it's a string so we should uh, should we should be able to call that length and to avoid this you just put null at uh, when we declare the variable so we assign here null so we put here null now if you run this because you have uh, the two exclamation mark operator now this will throw that null pointer exception that i talked about so we get exception in thread main uh, so it doesn't matter what thread main is now for now you get java that length null pointer exception so this is the the null pointer exception but if uh, we assign down here this variable text equals uh, some text and now if we run this code you get 9 because this is the length of this so this is how we can use this operator the next operator that you can use is the elvis operator and to show you how uh, that works i'm gonna delete this code now i'm gonna declare another variable up here so i'm gonna call it text two. we put equals and we type text now to use the elvis operator we put a question mark and the colon and now we need to uh, type something on the right of the Elvis operator so we put here some text i'm going to explain immediately how this works so i'm going to type here uh, some text now what the Elvis operator is doing is saying if this variable text is null then assign what is on the right to this variable text too if this uh, variable uh, text is not null then assign what is th to this variable to our variable text uh, to our variable text too and now let's uh, let's type here text too and uh, let's delete the length so now if you run this code let's uh, actually put something more discrete like uh, the variable is null so if you run this code now we get the variable is null because it uh, checked to see to, to see t if this uh, variable on the left is null and if it is if it is null it's gonna it assigned this to, to a variable takes two and then you output that in the console 
but if this is not null then it's going to assign what is on this what whatever value this variable has to our variable takes to so if now i put here text equals this variable is not null now if i run this now this will this will evaluate to true so it's gonna assign whatever value is on the left to our variable text to our variable text too and we're gonna see in the output uh, the variable is not null so when a variable text too has now the value assigned from our for this variable so this is the shorter way of writing let me show you how we will write this in the longer way so in the longer way you will have something like this so let's delete this code actually yeah, yeah let's delete this code we'll have a variable called text uh, two, and uh, it's gonna have an empty string so we would what we would have to do without the Elvis operator we have to first check if text uh, not equal to is not equal to null then um, we're gonna co call our variable uh, text to and we're gonna assign uh, text to it else we're gonna assign to our uh, text to variable the text this variable is null so this is the longer way we're doing uh, of what we did previously so if i press ctrl tilt format the code now if you run this you'll see the, uh, the the same of the variable is not null so we get the variable so it's not null and this is the longer way of doing the same thing so if i assign here uh, if i assign actually if i delete this and the variable will have null let's press ctrl z If I run this, now the else part is executed. So our variable text two, it will be it will have the this is variable. This variable is null. The text assigned to it, and then it's going to output that in the console. So this is the longer way of doing what of what we had uh, previously. So if I press Control Z to have uh, the Elvis operator back. So that was the longer way of doing what, of what we're doing here in one simple line of code. So this is our discussion about uh, nullable types and uh, the, uh, I hope that you got a lot from this uh, video and see you in the next video. Right, now it's time to start our discussion about functions. But first let's create a new project and I'm going to speed up the process now a little bit because we already did this a few times. So I'm going to call it functions, should be in Pascal case. Select IntelliJ, click on next and click finish. All right, let's delete the code inside the curly braces. Let's hide the project pane. And uh, let's start by saying that until now we have written our code only inside the main function. And uh, occasionally we have called the println function to output some code uh, to the console. But uh, as I said at the beginning of our videos, you can uh, create your own functions in uh, Kotlin. So let's see how we can do that. So go down here at the end of our main function, at the end of our uh, enclosing curly brace. And to declare a function, we type the keyword fun. We put space. Next, we need to give a name to our function. And the name of the function should say what the function is doing. And uh, generally, it's a verb. I'm going to call this function say hello. And it should be in camel case. Next, we put parentheses because uh, functions can take input to work with it. And next, we put curly braces because this is where we're going to put our uh, instructions or our statements. This is going to put our logic. Now, let's add the print uh, ln uh, statement here. Let's type the text hello. And now let's run this code. Now, as the input, we don't see 
nothing here because if you hover over this say hello function it says function say hello is never used because in order for that this in order for this function to be used you need to call it from main function and to call it from main function we type here the name of the function you can type it uh, entirely you or you can uh, type uh, start typing and uh, IntelliJ is going to be it's going gonna, gonna to give you some suggestions so press enter to fill in fill in that for you and also press control alt l to format the code now let's run our code now you're gonna see that it says in the output hello because the main function executes in what's inside the curly braces and uh, on the line 2 it says that we have a function that we're calling here a function executes it executes the the say hello function the code inside the say hello function in this case is a simple println uh, statement and then uh, it outputs that to the console and uh, it exits the the code it uh, finishes the process because we don't have anything else below for say hello but what we can do is put another say hello here to call our function again and now we're gonna see the output hello two times because now we're calling the say hello function first on the line two and second on the line three so it will be executed two times so you can see that uh, in this way functions are uh, reusable and uh, are separate chunks of code can, which can be can be reused and uh, you'll see that they can be reused in uh, specific cases now as I said functions can take input and to make a function to receive some input we need to define what is called a parameter and to define a parameter we type the name of the variable first I'm gonna call it name and we need to explicitly provide a type here so for the type I'm going to choose string and we need to explicitly provide a type here because is there there is no way for the type to be inferred here because uh, the value that you're going to pass to this uh, say hello function is going to be here so it's impossible uh, to know uh, to what uh, kind of value we're, we're going to pass to it so this is why you need to explicitly say what data this parameter or this variable is going to store so let's delete the second say hello now let's uh, change the text that we have here in the println let's uh, let's refer the parameter name so put a dollar sign and start typing name and you can see that it has this p for parameter and press enter now what is going to happen now is that this say hello function is, is going to be called is going to be executed from our main function and uh, the code inside the say hello function is also going to be executed and uh, specifically is going to execute this uh, this uh, text that we type here to be outputted it's going to execute the hello and then it's, it's going to execute uh, what's what value if we have passed as an argument for this parameter and uh, if you don't, you don't know what an argument is the argument is the value that you pass to the um, to the function so in this case up here we need to pass uh, some text so I'm gonna put a name here not here it should be in a uh, double quotation marks and we see that we have a hint here it says which is which says the name of the very the name of the parameter which is name now what is gonna happen now is this uh, this uh, say hello function is gonna be called uh, and this value that we passed here is going to be used in our println statement where uh, where, we are, where we're referring now which is uh, here you, here we're using the name and it's going to use that value and that value is going to be output down here and let's run the code to see now we get hello alex because now it's using the value that we passed here as the as an argument to the parameter name and it is using that uh, value down here where uh, we type the println uh, statement or function now functions can take multiple arguments multiple uh, arguments and uh, to do that we need to define 
I should say that you can define more parameters for uh, the function and a function can take multiple arguments. And to define another parameter, we put a comma here and uh, we type the name of our uh, parameter is going to be age and we need to provide the type and I'm going I'm to provide the type as an integer as an integer because it's going to store whole numbers and uh, here we're going to put an exclamation mark and I'm going to type your age is now we need to refer the parameter age and also need to provide the value for that parameter Now, if you go up here, now it says that you need to provide a value for the parameter has age. It says no value passed for the, for the parameter age. So here you need to type on uh, a value for our parameter that we define. So let's say 22. All right. Now, if you run this code, now those uh, parameters that we define here are going to use the values, the arguments that we type here inside uh, our uh, curly braces or uh, how is often called the body of the function or the code block. So it's going to use the values here and here. Now, another important thing to know is that you can not change the value of a parameter. So if you type here age equals, let's say 30. Now gonna, if you hover over here because you have an underline, it says val cannot be reassigned because those parameters are are declared as vals, as variable vals. So that means that they are immutable. You cannot change their values. The only way to use a variable which can uh, have this value change is to declare on. So if you declare here a, va a variable, I'm going to declare it as a var to change its value. I'm going to call it number. And uh, if I uh, assign here a value of 50, now, I as you know, you can change now its value to, let's say, 70 and you can also assign the parameter here to our variable number and now we can change its value also you can put number and you can put another value here all right another important thing to know is that this variable that we define here also the parameters are scoped inside the function say hello. In other words, they cannot be referred or accessed outside of the, the curly braces of the say hello function. So if I try to access that uh, number variable here, it's not working. If I try to access, access here on the main function, let's say I type number, I can't because it's scoped inside the say hello function. Uh, it exists only inside the say hello function. The same thing with the parameters, age or uh, name. So, in this way you can see that functions can uh, be very useful because they are uh, chunks of code which are reusable and uh, flexible. And uh, to see an example uh, with this, let's declare another function down here. Let's call it, uh, let's uh, type the fun keyword. Let's call it get data. And uh, this function is going to mimic the uh, a real function uh, in a real app, which can get some data from the internet. Of course, that we're not going to get some data from the internet, but we're going to uh, mimic that behavior. So here I'm going to define a parameter. Let's call it uh, data. And for the type, let's choose string, right? Let's uh, put the curly braces and uh, here let's add the print uh, ln statements. And uh, here we're going to print your data is and uh, I'm going to refer the parameter data. All right. Now, what I can do up here is to define a Boolean uh, variable. It's going to be a val. I'm going to call it has internet connection. I'm going to assign a value of true to it. Now I can put an if statement here. Now I can check to see if that uh, expression is true. So I can put equal equals true or 
use the shortcut because it's better. Here I'm gonna put the curly braces. Now I'm gonna call the get data function only if this condition is true. So in our case it's true, that, but in a real app that can be can be false. So in that case you can do something else. As you're gonna see, we're gonna let's also add the else part here. And here we're gonna call another function, which can which is gonna be called in the case that uh, there is no internet connection. All right. So above here you can put some logic to get the data from the internet. But because this is a simple example, we're gonna type here dire directly uh, some text. Let's put some data. And uh, for the else part, in the case that uh, there is no internet connection, that variable is false. We can declare another function down here. To, uh, and I'm going to call it fun show message and uh, this is not going to have any parameters it's going to have only simple println uh, statement and it's going to say that uh, there is no internet connection. Alright, so now let's go up here now and now you're gonna call the show message uh, function in the else part. Now if you run this code you're gonna see Hello Alex, which is our uh, first function up here on the line 2. Your age is 22 and next to see your data is some data. Because it uh, executes the say hello function, then it declares this variable and uh, it checks it checks to see if this condition is true and this condition is true and uh, it executes this function, get data. So uh, this is why you get your data is some data. But if uh, for whatever reason the user has no internet connection, let's say you assign a value of false to it, to this. Now this function is going to be called show message. So this function show message now is called and the code inside the show message function is uh, called, which is println, this println uh, statement which says there is no internet connection. In a real app you can have uh, some logic to show a uh, dialogue that there is no internet connection. And uh, you can see that in this way with functions you can divide your uh, code in uh, different chunks of uh, different in different chunks of uh, code which can be called in very specific cases. So in this case uh, we only call uh, our f uh, functions only in, in the case that we have internet connection or in the case that we don't have internet connection. So in this way uh, we have uh, divided our code in different uh, chunks of code which can be called in different uh, uh, specific uh, scenarios. And in this way uh, uh, we can write a program because uh, if you just put your code, all of your code in the main function and you execute that code uh, from top to bottom you, you cannot create a program like that. So uh, this was an additional uh, discussion with uh, the get data and show message and uh, I hope that I not uh, confused you a lot. So see in the next video. Alright, so in the last video we seen how we can uh, create functions, how we can uh, call our functions, how we can define parameters uh, to our functions, how we can uh, send uh, data to our function as arguments, now it's time to see how we can return some data from a function. But let's first read the code that we have here to make things more clear. And uh, the code inside the function, uh, the main function. All right. Now let's define another function. I'm going to type the fun keyword space and it's going to be called get max. And this function is going to return uh, the maximum of uh, two integers. So I'm going to define here a parameter. I'm going to call it a. In a real app, you should use more descriptive names. It's going to be of type int. And the next one is going to be called b. 
and it's going to be also of type int. I'm going to put the curly braces and I'm going to press enter. Now, to get the maximum uh, value between these uh, two numbers, we type here, we type here val max and here we type an if expression. So we type if a greater than b, then we're going to assign a to our max uh, variable. Else, we're going to assign b. And in the case that the two numbers are equal, b is going to be assigned to our uh, max, uh, max variable. Now, in order to return this uh, to, in order to return this uh, value to our uh, function, we need first to, def to to say to the function what kind of data is going to return. And to do that, we go here at the enclosing uh, parentheses. And uh, if you don't have uh, spaces here or you're uh, wondering about uh, how to have uh, the proper formatting, you just press uh, Control alt l and the code is going to be formatted. All right? And here we put a colon, and here we, de we define what, uh, what type of data this function is going to return. And in this case, it's going to be an integer. So we put int here. And this is similar to the way we declare a type for a variable. Now, if you go, if you go down here now, you see that it says a return expression is required in a function to block body. So now we need to return this uh, now we, we need to return some data that we define here. In this case, we need to return uh, an integer. And to return uh, the maximum value to our function, we type here return, the keyword return, and our value, which is uh, our variable max, and press enter. Now, if you call this function in our main function, get max, and now let's also pre press Control alt l to format the code. And here we, we let's say that we type uh, two arguments for our parameters. Let's say that we put five and nine. Now, if you run this code, now you're gonna see in the output nothing because uh, in order to in order to get this uh, value, we need to retain this value, to capture this value in a variable. And to do that, we define a variable uh, in front of our uh, getMax function. It's also be uh, a val. I'm going to call it max. And we're going to assign uh, the getMax uh, uh, function to our variable. And that is going to return uh, our uh, maximum uh, number. Now, uh, you now you may see here that you have uh, two names. Uh, we have the same name here and the same name, and that is not a problem because uh, this variable max that we have inside the the get max function exists only inside the the get max function. It's scoped only here. This is why you can use uh, the same name here. So if I try to type here also max to declare the variable of, which is going to be called max, I can't because. Uh, it says completing declaration because if you because the compiler doesn't know if you assign a value let's say to this it will not know what variable to 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 call because you have the same name but uh, up here is not a problem because uh, this is in uh, the block of the main function so it exists only here and this exists only here now we have called our uh, get max function and this function is going to return the maximum of uh, these two values which is nine now we need to print this value in our console. And to print this value, you just type here println and uh, we're referring our uh, max variable. Now if you run this code, you're gonna get nine. Because uh, our get max function is called, uh, the, two, the two arguments are passed to, to our function. Then the code inside the, our get max function it's uh, executed. It compares these two, two numbers, and uh, if uh, a is greater than b, then it assigns a to our max uh, a max variable, or it's gonna if that is not true, it's gonna assign the value of uh, b, and then it returns that max value to the 
f- to the function which is uh, called. So if this function returns that value here. And, ne- and here we retain, we capture that value which, re- which is returned from the get max function in our max variable. And then we print that uh, max variable with our println uh, function or uh, statement. And then we see the output in our console 9, right? Another important thing to know is that after we type the return uh, call or the return keyword, the the function is lived. The function is uh, stopped there. So if we add uh, other text here, let's say we add here a println and we type here uh, some text, we see that this is highlighted and it says that it's, this is a reachable code because after we typed our return max, our uh, function is uh, stopped, is lived, and uh, it's not executing any any code below of, uh, of that return uh, uh, call or, or, or uh, of that return uh, keyword, right? Another important thing that you can do with uh, return keyword is that you can uh, return turn from a function without returning any kind of value and in that case it will have the same effect and uh, that means that it will uh, leave the function right there even though we don't return any kind of value so we, we, I can type here return but let's uh, delete here the type because now it's expecting a value to be returned and now this will have the same effect it will leave the function right there and it will not execute any any kind uh, any line of code below of our return uh, keyword so if i type here uh, a println uh, statement and i put some text here as you can see this has the same effect uh, if you type the return keyword in your function it will stop the execution of the function and every line of code below of the return keyword is not going to be executed. So it's very good uh, to know uh, this also. Another important thing to know is that we can, we can we can only return a single value with the return keyword. So we cannot return here to two integers, let's say. And um, also we cannot have two returns in the same uh, function. Let's say if I put here also return max. I can't because this is also a reachable code, but I, I can have two returns, two returns calls if they are reaching different branches. So if I change this uh, if uh, expression to an if uh, statement, so if I type something like this, if uh, let's say a greater than b, let's add the curly braces now, we type here return a. Okay. Else, return B. So now we have two returns, but they are never reached together. They 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 are they are, they are uh, always reached separately. So this is why you can use here two returns because I said they are they are uh, reached uh, always separately. So if you run this code, you're gonna see the same output. So you see nine. So this is another way to to write the same thing that we had previously. That, but it's recommended to use uh, to use uh, what we had previously because with uh, specifically it's better to have an if uh, expression. Another way to to write to the same thing, but in a more concise way, and let's un- undo the code that we have uh, that we had previously. So let's press Control Z. So now I have the co- code that we had previously. Now if you hover over over this max, it says variable used only in formatting return can be in line. So if you click here in line variable, now this thing does the same thing that uh, it, it was uh, doing previously. But this is a shorter way to write the same thing. So now it returns A if this condition is true. Otherwise, else part, the else part is called and it returns B. So we have the same thing, but uh, uh, written in a shorter way. All right, another way to write the same thing that we have here is by using what is called the single expression function. And uh, to do that, we can uh, remove the curly braces. We can put our code up here 
you can uh, remove the first curly brace and you can also remove the return uh, keyword and here you put equals and this uh, now does the same thing that uh, the code uh, the previous code was doing but uh, this is a more uh, concise way and it's recommended to use uh, this only if you know that you, you have in your uh, function a single uh, expression or uh, in other words if you know that you have a single line of code and you can also remove the type here because the type can be be inferred and uh, again only use this if you know that you have in your uh, function a single uh, line of code and uh, in that case you can uh, you can uh, skip the return uh, keyword but if you, do, if you have multiple lines of uh, code you should always use the curly braces and the return uh, call or the return keyword all right so this is our discussion about how we can return uh, a value from a function all right so now let's continue our discussion about functions and now it's time to look at uh, what is called function overloading and let's say that i want here to pass uh, not two integer types but two doubles to be compared so let's say that I uh, type here 6.5 and uh, 9.6. Now, this will not work because we define here explicitly that the parameters are of type uh, int. So we cannot pass here double. Uh, and uh, a solution to this, it may be to create another function with a different name and to define uh, the parameters as doubles. But that... Uh, does not make a lot of sense because uh, we we are doing the exact same thing so it does not make sense to create a new to create a function with a different name so what we can do instead is to let's change this back to integers is to duplicate this get max function and to do that you can press ctrl d or command line on mac so i'm press i'm gonna press ctrl d here now what i can do is change the types of the variables so i can put here instead of uh, integer I put double and here I can put also double let's add the space to make things more clear now if I pass here let's say uh, 5.6 and uh, 9.7 now you see that we have no error so if you run this code Alright, so we get in the output 9.7 and this is correct, this uh, is bigger than 5.6 but now it's using the second function which is the function which has the parameters as of type double and you can see that uh, this function now uh, which is using the parameters uh, as uh, integers is grey out because the compiler can figure out what function to use by the argument uh, types we pass here so in this case we pass here doubles and it knows that uh, it has to use this function which has the types uh, which has the bar parameters defined uh, as type of double right another way to overload the uh, function is to let's also press ctrl d is by changing the number of parameters so i can uh, put here let's say uh, also integer also let's pass an, uh, the third parameter now and uh, this is also going to be an integer it's going to be called c it's going to be of type int all right now let's change this logic to an if uh, statement so let's delete the if expression let's put the curly braces right so let's change this now so you can type it here now if a greater than or equal to b and a is greater than or equal to to c then gonna return a so now we're using the return keyword else if now uh, we're putting here an else if b is greater than equal to a and b is greater than equal to c 
then return b else c is going to be the bigger value so put here return c all right let's press control alt uh, return b here all right so i need to put here uh, the type this way i get that error and right now everything is okay oh so from here is the problem right so now if you run this code let's change this to let's say five seven and uh, ten now if you run this code you see that the two functions above are gray out and now it's going to use the third one which has uh, third parameters all right, so when you get we get in the output 10 which is correct so if you change this to test let's say we put here uh, 100 let's put here 3 and if you run this code now we get 100 and this is correct Alright, so this is our discussion about function overloading and you can use function overloading every time you know that you will uh, do the same task but with different uh, type of parameters or with a different number of parameters. Also, you may have noticed that we have uh, an underline over, uh, he, over if, over the if statement. So uh, if you hover over here, it says that the return can be lifted out of if. So if you click this, you can uh, write it in this way so, or we can keep it in the previous way but uh, because this is uh, underlined that means that Kotlin recommends to use it in this way in this way so see you in the next video where we're going to talk about uh, default parameters all right so now it's time to look at another features uh, that you can use with functions and that is called default parameters and uh, let's first declare a function so I'm going to declare it down here at the end of our enclosing curly brace of our main fun. I'm going to call it send message. Let's put the parenthesis and inside the parenthesis, I'm going to define two parameters. The first is going to be called name. It's going to be of type string. And this second one is going to be called uh, message. And it's going to be also of type string. Now let's uh, you de declare the curly braces press enter and let's print those uh, parameters in our console so let's put a print line here and inside the also uh, while I'm typing uh, while I'm typing this print line may seem that this print line function is a, a function which is overload referring uh, to our uh, previous video because you can see that it, it can it has the same name but it can take uh, different types of parameters here so it has in this thing which is any byte short char long so the print line function that uh, we've used uh, throughout our videos is uh, overloaded this is why you can pass different uh, different types of uh, of data to it now let's type here print ln quotation marks and inside the quotation mark I'm going to type name equals dollar sign name so now it's going to print the argument values that we're going to pass to this function as uh, parameters now let's call this function here so let's type send uh, let's press cont control alt l to format our code and here I'm going to pass a name let's say uh, Alexa and the uh, message let's say hello now if you run this code you're gonna see in the output um, uh, the name uh, here is gonna be this uh, argument that to type here which is Alexa and the message is gonna be hello so we have this but let's say that for whatever reason the user doesn't want to to send uh, any kind of message but we still uh, need to use this uh, function what you can do then uh, one way is to remove uh, this parameter uh, all the way but uh, that's not uh, good because you still need to use this function with uh, those two parameters the name and 
and the message. So in, let's say that if the user doesn't pass any message, we can define here what is called a default parameter. A default uh, parameter. So we, we can assign here a default value for our parameter. So I'm going to put here uh, just uh, double quotation marks, or uh, or we can put some text here. But let's put the, just the double quotation marks, which, which is just an empty text. So if now I don't pass a message here. Now it's still gonna work because as a value for this parameter is gonna use the default value that we defined here. All right, so let's run this code to see now how, how it works. So now I get name Alex and message equals empty because uh, em double quotation marks without any text is uh, an empty text. Now if I want to pass here now the message now I can pass here the message and now uh, our default value is going to be replaced with the argument uh, value that we typed here so now I'm going to see name Alexa message hello all right you can do the same thing for uh, for the name so here you can define let's say the, the user doesn't want to to type a name and you can define a default name let's say user yes now Let's say that I delete both uh, arguments here. And I just have an empty function. If I run this, now it's going to use the default values that we type here, respectively user and this empty string. So now I get name, user, and message. Now let's put back uh, what we have. So let's put here uh, Alexa. And let's uh, put our message here again. Now let's run this code again. Now, what we can also do is uh, use what is called named parameters. And uh, let's say that I want to to pass a parameter only for the second uh, second. Uh, let's, let's say that I want to pass an argument type for only for the second parameter that we define here, respectively, for our message. So if I delete this. Now let's say, let's say that I delete uh, the argument uh, for our name. And if I want to pass a value only for the message, let's put in the quotation mark because it's a string. Let's say I put the message hello here. Now you can see that the hint is name. So it's using the first uh, parameter that we define here, not the second. So what we can do now to pass uh, a value to only to our second parameter because uh, as you can see it's using the it's assigning this value that we type here for this parameter and to solve that you can use what is called name parameters so with name parameters we can um, type an argument for our parameter irrespective of the order in which they are defined so in our case we have the name for define and then the message so to use uh, that you can uh, type the name of the parameter let's say message now you see that we have this p message and it's equals to a string so that means that we need to pass some text there and now we can pass here hello and now this is going to work because uh, now we can pass uh, a value to our parameter irrespective of the order in which they are uh, defined uh, here right so now we get name is uh, this default user and the uh, message is hello and we can do the same for uh, for the second one, which is name. So I can put now here name, and I can type here, uh, let's say Alexa. And if you run this, now you get Alexa is the name and the message is hello. So with uh, named parameters, this is how they are called, or name arguments, we can uh, pass a value to our uh, parameters irrespective of the order in which they are defined uh, in the function. So in our case, name is first defined and you saw there that when I try to use uh, the message to assign a value only for the message, it's what it was using the first parameter because this was the order in which they were defined. But with this named parameters, you can change, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, type an argument irrespective of the order in which they are defined. And you can put this in a uh, multiple lines to make it more clear like this let's say 
So this is our discussion about uh, named uh, parameters and uh, default parameters. But before we end our video, I should uh, say that uh, to the default parameters, we cannot only type literals values like we typed here uh, some values directly. We can use variables or uh, you can use uh, a function which can return a value. So I can define here a function, let's say fun send uh, text is not going to have any parameters. It's going to return uh, a string. So I'm going to define here a string as the type of return. And here we're going to type return and let's type some text. Now we can call this function here send text and now this value which is returned for this function send text is going to be assigned to our parameter message so now if you run this code let's uh, increase this a little bit so now if you run this code you're going to see that the uh, now the default value for the parameter message is the return value from our send text uh, function so you can see now that we have uh, Okay, so let's change it here to no value for our message. So now if you run this code, because uh, there we have an argument passed, so let's not pass no, no argument. So now it's using the value that we was, was passed as the default value for our parameter, which is this return value from this function. Now, because here we have one single line of code, we have one single expression, we just return uh, some text or function, we don't have uh, multiple statements in our uh, function, we can uh, write this as a single expression function. And uh, you can uh, remove the curly brace and you can uh, write this as a single uh, expression body like we did in a uh, previous video. So you can put it just equals and you can remove the type here also. So if you run this code, now you're going to see to the output uh, for the parameter message some text, which is the value which is returned from this uh, function, from the single body expression function, right? So see you in the next video. All right, now it's time to look at the var arg keyword and how we, we can use the var arg keyword with functions. But first, let's declare a function below of our enclosing uh, curly brace of our main function. So I'm going to type here the fun keyword to declare a function. I'm going to call it sum because it's going to return the sum of all the parameters that we're going to define. So I'm going to define here uh, some parameters. First it's going to be called a, it's going to be of type int. Second is going to be called b, also int. Third is going to be called c, also an int. And the final one is going to be called d, also an int. And this, this function is going to return uh, the sum of all of those parameters. So we need to define here uh, the return type, which is going to be an int, whole number. And now we can put the curly braces and here we type return a plus b plus c plus d. And this is going to return the sum of uh, all the parameters that we define here or uh, the values that is going to be passed as arguments to this function. And you can write this as a single expression function if you want. So you can write this uh, like this if you want. This will have the same effect. But uh, I, will, I will write it with the... Uh, curly braces because uh, it will make things more clear. So let's uh, undo this. All right now let's call this function here. Sum. Let's press Control Alt L to format the code and uh, let's pass some values here. So I'm going to type here 5, 6, 7 and uh, 10. Right. If you press Shift Control P on this, you're gonna see that the type of this function. Let's press again. The type of this function is an int. So this function return returns an integer. So uh, it's an ex is it's an expression. That means that we can put this instead of putting uh, storing the, um, uh, the return uh, value in a variable, we can put this directly in a println uh, 
function. So you can type here print ln and we can put the function inside here because that function is of type int so it's going to return uh, the sum of all the arguments that we type there. So now if you run this code we get, we get 28 because 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 10 is 28. Now if I want to pass another parameter here let's say that I want to pass another number here I can't because I am limited by the number of parameters that we define here of course that I can define another parameter uh, here but what if I want to pass uh, 10 numbers or uh, 15 numbers or 100 numbers in that case it will be very tedious to write all of those parameters and and to solve that you need to use what is called a varg vararg keyword and a vararg keyword allows us to pass more than one parameter actually more than one argument to our uh, parameter so to declare a vararg keyword we type here uh, we type here var arg so this is the keyword var arg it stands for uh, variable arguments now we need to define uh, a name for this uh, var arg i'm going to call it uh, numbers and we also need to specify a type what kind of uh, values this var arg is going to store now this return keyword uh, is uh, this variables here are red because they don't exist now if i want to but first let's say that i want to type here another uh, parameter now now you see that we have no problem so i can type here uh, whatever uh, number of, of uh, numbers i want and there is no problem as you can see now uh, to to sum the values uh, which are stored in these vararg numbers we need to use something which we didn't cover yet but we have a separate section which uh, i show you how to in which i explain uh, this thing that i'm going to use now and that is loops because uh, now we need to loop through our numbers and to add our numbers to a variable so we need to use what is called uh, a for loop so to do that first we declare a variable i'm gonna call it uh, let's say uh, result i'm gonna assign a value of zero now to use a for loop we type for and again i'm gonna go into more detail about this in a a separate section but now we need to use this because there's not uh, another way to to sum up the values inside the vararg uh, numbers and here we need to define uh, a name for our variable so it's going to be called number and now uh, we use the keyword in and now we're referring the parameter the vararg parameter which is defined up called numbers all right now we here you can put the curly braces and inside the curly braces we're going to type here it should be res numbers result and now we're going to use that abbreviation which is plus and equals plus equals number and now here we're going to return the result return result All right so let's uh, explain what we have here so first we declare a variable we assign a value of zero to it so it's a type uh, int next what this uh, for loop is doing so this for loop uh, is doing what is doing is executing um, a line uh, of code multiple times so it executing it's executing uh, uh, what's inside the curly braces until uh, the it finishes to it finishes the to loop through all these numbers which are stored in the uh, vararg numbers so it uh, first assigns uh, the first uh, the first number to our number here and it loops and it adds that it adds that number to our result then it, it does that again and again and again 
until it finishes, until it reaches uh, the, the final number 5. And in that case, it's also going to assign from our uh, numbers uh, the number 5 to our number. And then that uh, number is going to be added to our result variable. And when it finishes uh, that uh, looping, when it finishes that uh, thing, it's going to return the result. It's going to return all the values which are which were been uh, added to our uh, result variable. So now if you print this, now we get 85 and probably this is the result of this uh, calculation. So this is how you can use vararg uh, numbers, vararg uh, keyword to store more than one uh, single, more than uh, a limited number of parameters defined uh, by you. And uh, Another short, shortcut to, to loop through this is using a, a for each loop. So we can do something like this. But this time, uh, let's say that I want, I don't want to return uh, something. So let's say that I delete this. And I, I can uh, type here, actually numbers for that, here you put that for each and here we type print ln again this is uh, a more complex uh, sub subject which is going to be covered in the next uh, videos so here, here we type print uh, ln and we type it all right now let's uh, let's call our sum Let's define some numbers here. Let's say that I type here 1, 4, 4. All right, so if you run this code, now you can see that every number in that uh, that we define here is printed one by one. So this number, this for each, which is also a loop, it goes through all of these numbers it, and it prints them one by one. And again, we're going to look at uh, for, uh, the for loop and the for each in uh, the next videos, but I had no other way to show you this example without using them. But if you feel confused by for the for each or the for loop, don't worry, we have a separate uh, section which, in which we talk about in detail about this. For now, we need to, only, the only thing you need to know is that you can um, pass an indefinite number of parameters of actually you can pass a diff an indefinite number of arguments to our uh, vararg numbers because this allows us to to par to, to pass uh, an indefinite number of uh, values so here you see that we have 1 4 5 6 7 8 9 5 7 and 6 the numbers that we have here so this uh, for each is going through all of them and it prints them one by one. So see you in the next video. All right, now it's time to start our discussion about loops. But first, let's create a new project. I'm going to call it loops. Select IntelliJ, click on next and finish. Right, a project is created. Let's delete the code inside the curly braces. Let's hide the project pane. And um, let's start by explaining what loops are and why you need to use them. So loops allows us to execute uh, a piece of code multiple times without uh, you writing down every uh, line of code uh, manually. So Let's say that I want to print uh, 10 numbers in the console or uh, 20 or 50. Instead of uh, printing, uh, instead of typing that code uh, manually line by line, which will be very tedious, you can use a loop and you can put that code in a loop and that code in the loop, it will be executed repeatedly uh, uh, until uh, a certain uh, number is uh, reached. So let's see how we can define a loop. To define a loop, we type here for 
this is the fir first loop that we're going to look at because there are other loops. So this is the for loop. We press enter. Inside the parentheses we type i. This is convention. You can put whatever uh, name you want there. Now we put here in. This is the keyword in. And now let's say that I want to loop from one and from one to ten. And to do that we type one dot dot. This is a range. To one to ten. Now I put the curly braces. And inside the, pre the curly braces, I'm, I'm going to put the code that I want to be executed 10 times. So I'm going to type here println and I'm going to type the value of i at each iteration. And uh, we can put it like this. You can type here, uh, you can put in the quotation marks and you can do the placeholder. You can put i. So now if you run this. So now we get i is 1, 2, until 10. So it, what it's doing is, is uh, looping through this range until it reaches 10. Then it stops. Now, uh, you can write this i uh, like I did it here using a placeholder or you can uh, write it like this. Now if you run this code, it will have the same effect but will not have the text. Uh, before here. So now we get 1 until 10. Now there are other, other, other vari variations to use uh, this uh, range and one of them is to use uh, until. So let's uh, comment this code. So let's press control slash Right now, let's type four again, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna call it also i. Here you can put whatever name you want, and uh, instead of uh, now I'm gonna put also the, again the in keyword, and instead of putting the dot dot to loop to a range, I'm gonna put one until ten. All right. Now I'm gonna add the println uh, statement and here I'm going to type uh, i and uh, this will have the same effect with a, sing with a single difference that 1 until 10 it's, is going to exclude 10 and 1 uh, using the range dot dot 10 it will include 10 so if you run this code you're going to see that you will not have uh, 10 here because 10 is excluded when uh, you, you're using the until. So now as you can see we have 1 until 9 and 10 is excluded because uh, now we're using the until. So uh, if, you're, if you're using the range which is uh, dot dot, it, uh, the last number is going to be included. But if you use uh, until the last number is going to be excluded. So it's important to know that this uh, two, respectively the until and uh, the range, can only count upwards. So we cannot put here uh, 10 until 1 because uh, the first uh, number, the number of on the left, needs to be smaller than the number on the right. So we cannot put 10 until 1. We can only count upwards. We can only put uh, 1 until 10 or uh, 1 dot dot 10. So to loop backwards we need to use another uh, thing. So let's comment this code also. Now to loop backwards we type 4. Again in the parentheses you put uh, i. Here you can put uh, whatever if you want. In so here you can put uh, whatever name, but uh, conventionally is I is used. Now I'm going to put in, and now I'm going to put down. First let's put uh, 10, down, down to 1. Let's add the curly braces, the print line, and let's put I here. 
Now this is gonna this is gonna count downwards now. It's gonna is gonna count from ten to one. So if you run this code. Now get 10, 9, so it's counting, it's, it's counting backwards, right? Another thing that you can do is that you can introduce an arbitrary step. So let's uh, let's comment this code also. Let's add below another code, another for loop. So here I'm gonna type for parentheses. Uh, let's put i and let's use uh, the until so in one until 10 so now I can put a uh, an arbitrary step so at uh, at at this arbitrary step that uh, number which uh, is that is that is at that arbitrary step is gonna be skipped so I can put here step two let's say so now I'm gonna put the code places to have the some code executed. I'm gonna put println and let's put here i. So now if you run this code, now I get one, three, five, seven, and nine. So you can see that uh, uh, at uh, the second uh, iteration the number is skipped. So we have one, two is skipped. Now we have then we have three, four three and four is skipped and so on so you can put this arbitrary step if you want so let's comment this code also and let's add the first code that we had uh, here to to talk a little bit more so let's put i in one let's put the range dot dot ten and curly braces I'm gonna type println i. Now, if run this code, we'll get the same ad output at, uh, as at the beginning of the, of the video. So, I'll get one. Uh, until 10 inclusive now again what this uh, loop is doing is going through this is going through this to this range from 1 to 10 and it's executing the code inside the curly braces 10 times and when it reaches 10 it stops and it, it executes the next line of code below here but because here we don't have any line of code uh, our uh, program uh, Exit is exit is and it's finished. So this is our discussion about for loop. There are uh, other lo loops which can loop uh, which can loop as long as a certain condition is true, not as long as uh, a, cer a certain number is reached. So we're gonna look at the next loops in the next video. See you next. Alright, now it's time to look at the next two loops that you can use in Kotlin, and those are the while and the do while loop. But first, let's um, open our previous project called loops because I'm going to type my code there. So open your previous project. And here I already have deleted the code that we had previously here. But uh, if you have the code, uh, delete it and uh, let's start our discussion about the while loop. So first I'm going to type uh, while. This is uh, this how you declare the while loop. And here you can uh, press enter to fill in uh, the the while key on the parenthesis for you or you can type manually the while and the parenthesis. So I'm gonna press enter to fill that for you, fill in that for me. And next you put a space and you put curly brace here. So I'm gonna put the left curly brace and press enter and the right curly brace is gonna be added automatically as you can see on the line uh, five. Now, a while loop loops as long as a certain condition is true. In contrast to the for loop which uh, loops for a specific number of time, a while uh, loop loops as long as uh, a condition or an expression is true. So this gives us more flexibility in um, 
circumstances or we don't know for uh, what uh, specific number of times we want our code to be repeated. So we put our uh, condition inside the parentheses here. And as long as this condition is true, the code inside the curly brace is going to be executed uh, repeatedly. So let's see how we can do that. So first, let's declare a variable here. I'm going to call it number and I'm going to assign a value of zero to it. And here I'm going to type while number is less than 10. Inside the curly brace, I'm going to type the println function. And we're going to output the value of our number. And then we're going to increment the value of our number. So I'm going to put number. I'm going to use the increment operator plus plus. Let's put a space here to have things uh, more clear. Now, if you run this code, you're going to see the numbers from 0 to 9. So what is happening? How this uh, works? First, we've declared a variable, we assign a value of 0 to it. Next, we loop using the while loop. And first, the while loop is checking to see if this condition inside the parentheses is true. So it checks to see if uh, the value of our uh, variable number is less than 10. And it's true because we have 0. Then it executes the code inside the, the curly braces and it uh, outputs the value of our number in the console using the println function. Then it increments the value of our number and then it loops again. But now the value of our number is 1. So now it will compare again uh, if uh, uh, the value of our number is less than 10, which is true. It will loop again, it will uh, output its value, it will increment its value, so now we have 2, and so on, until uh, it reaches 9. When it reaches 9, it will increment the value, it will, it will print, uh, it will output the value in the console, it, it will increment its value, then it will check again to see if this condition is true, but now the value is going to be 10, because uh, it was incremented when it was 9, and this condition is going to evaluate to false, and the code inside the curly braces is not going to be executed. This is why we don't have 10 here. And uh, it executes the code that comes below of our while loop. That because we don't have any code, the program is terminated. And you can uh, write uh, this thing in one single line, but it's recommended to use uh, this form only if you know that you have one single statement in your uh, loop. So if I can delete this, this two. And I can put here directly number plus plus. And because this returns the value, it increments the value and it returns the value. It's an expression. I can uh, I can run this code and it will have the same output. But if I delete the increment operator uh, at after the variable and if I put it before, now you're going to see a different output here because this increments the value of uh, of our number, then it decrements the value of our number. And this is called prefix in increment, increment. So this is called prefix incrementing. And uh, the, the previous one, let's press Ctrl Z. This is called postfix increment. So this is postfix because it's at the end of our variable. And uh, if you put uh, the green increment operator at the uh, the beginning of, of our variable is called prefix or oh, increment. Anyway, let's press Ctrl Z to have the code that we had previously and the curly braces. Now, look what happens if, if I delete the increment, uh, if I don't increment our variable now. Now, uh, let's uh, talk what is happening because we don't increment the variable and the variable always has the value of zero, this will always be true. And it will execute the code inside the curly braces forever. So we'll have what is called an infinite loop. So if you run this code, now you can see that uh, it prints zero forever because this condition never ever is to, to, to false. So let's stop this by pressing on this uh, red uh, square. So now the process, uh, the, the program is terminated. So this is why you need to increment the value of our number because uh, we want that condition to be false at uh, some point in the in the, in the in the in the future. Next, let's say that uh, I assign here ten. 
So if I run this code, now this condition is going to be false because 10 is not less than 10. And the code inside the curly braces is not going to be executed. So now we have no output here because this condition is evaluated to false and uh, it's not executing the code inside the curly braces. But there are certain situations where you'll want to have your code executed at least once, even though the initial condi the initial uh, condition or the initial expression is false. So if I delete the curly braces and the code inside the curly braces here, now to to do what I said, if, to execute the, the code even though the condition is initially set to false, to execute the code at least once, you need to use a do while loop. And to use a do while loop, you put here a do, press enter to add the curly braces. And we put our while at the end of, of our uh, enclosing curly brace of our do. And here inside the curly brace, uh, I'm going to put our println function. And I'm going to output uh, the value of our uh, variable number. So now if you run this, now I get 10 because this executes the code inside the curly braces at, at least once and after that it, it uh, comes down here and checks to see if this condition is true or false. And if this condition is uh, true, it will repeat the code uh, but if the condition is false, it, uh, it, will, it will not repeat the code. But the important aspect here is that it will um, execute the code inside the curly brace at least once, irrespective of uh, our condition, if the condition is true of, or false. In our case, it's false. So these are the three loops that you can use in a Kotlin, the for loop, the while loop, and the do while loop. Now it's time to see um, how we can use the continue and the break keywords with uh, those loops. So let's press Ctrl Z to undo the code, to have the while loop uh, back, because I'm gonna start with the while loop and to see how we can use the break and continue keywords with the while loop. Let's uh, bring this up a little bit. So let's first look at the continue keyword and the continue keyword can be used to bypass a section of code. So let's say that I want to skip the number seven in our uh, loop. So I can type here if our variable number equals two, so two equals seven, let's put curly braces, press enter to add the right curly brace, continue. So now what this is gonna do is when it's gonna reach the number seven and this condition is gonna be true, it's gonna call continue and it's gonna bypass the code that comes below of our uh, if statement. So if you run this code, look uh, what happens. It, it happens nothing because uh, here our uh, number has a value of 10. So this condition is false. So the code is not executed. So let's put here zero. Now if you run this code, so it gets zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. But, uh, and you see that at seven, at seven it uh, it skips the code, but why you don't have the next numbers? This is because uh, unintentionally we created here an infinite loop. So let's stop this and uh, to explain. So what happens here is that because um, we said, we say here explicitly to, to check here explicitly, we check here to see if our number is equal to seven, then we're gonna continue. In other words, you're gonna uh, skip the code which comes below of our uh, of our uh, if uh, then statement. Then this code is never called. So this code is never called the println and the, more importantly, the increment uh, operator is not, never called on our uh, number variable. And because of that, because our variable is not incremented here, it, uh, when it's gonna loop again, it, it will uh, have again the value seven. So this condition uh, the, in the if is gonna evaluate again to true and it's gonna call continue again. And because this code again is never reached, this code, and the value is no, not, not incremented, it, it, it will still have the value seven. So this is gonna evaluate again to true. So it does this uh, forever. And to change that, we need to put our uh, number and which is incremented before our, our, our if, and that is gonna solve the problem. So now if I, let's, uh, no. Now 
Now if I run the code, let's increase this. Now get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7 is skipped, then 8, 9, and 10. Because now when this uh, condition evaluates to true, it will continue. It's not going to print uh, the code. It's not going to be executed below of our if. And uh, it will come back to loop. And now it's going to increment the value. And the value is going to be 8 instead of 7. This is going to evaluate to false. And the continue is not going to be called. And it will print uh, the number 8. And it will do the same for, uh, it will increment the value again, and then we'll have 9, and so on. So this is how you can use the continue keyword, and uh, you have to be careful where you put your, in, uh, your uh, where, you, where you increment your variable, because uh, as you saw, you can uh, easily get into an infinity loop. Now, you can have a more uh, complex expression here. So you can put here, if uh, number is uh, greater than, let's say, 2, and number is less than uh, 8. Now if you run this, look what happens. Now you get 1, 2, and then you get 8, 9, and 10. Because what uh, this condition now checks is, uh, is uh, if our uh, number is greater than 10 and less than 8, then continue, then skip that number. So this is why the numbers between uh, uh, 2 and 8 are skipped, because uh, we call continue on uh, on them. And uh, if you hover over here, you see that it says the two comparisons should be converted to a range check. So we can uh, write the same condition that we have here using a range, but uh, this is different from a range uh, uh, that you, you've uh, used in a for loop, in the sense that this is now checking to see if our number is in the range 3 to, from 3 to 7. So if you run this code, Now I have the exact same output, but now uh, we are using the range to, to check to see if our number is in that range. And if it is that range, we, we call continue to skip that. Um, the next thing that you can do is you can uh, break the loop. You can stop the loop using uh, the break here. So I can say here again, if number equals equals, let's say 7, call break. So I'm going to type here break. Now, when this condition is going to evaluate to true, it's going to call break and the loop is going to stop. It's not going to execute uh, any line of code after that. It's going to stop, it's going to leave, and it's going to execute the code which comes below of here. But in our case, we don't, don't have any code. So you see that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And when it reaches uh, 7, it breaks and it not, it's stopping the loop. It's not printing the value and it executes the loop. So it terminates. So um and we can do the same thing with a uh, for loop so we can use the for we can use the uh, continue and uh, and break with a for loop so you can type here for let's say i in let's create uh, let's say 0 to 10 let's create this range let's add the curly braces now i can say here if i in let's say 3 to 8 then continue let's print the value let's type here print ln let's print the value of i here so now if you run this code So we have our first loop, which loops uh, to 6, and then it breaks because you call break there. Then it, using the for loop, it loops. It loops uh, from 0 to 10, but uh, because here we're checking to see if our number uh, is in uh, the range 3 to 8, then skip it. We get 0, 1, 2, and then the numbers, uh, the 3 and uh, the numbers between the three and the numbers between three and eight inclusive are skipped here. So we have uh, 
zero, one, two, and then the numbers between two and nine are uh, skipped, and we have nine and ten. And we can use uh, also the break keyword with the for. We can put here if i equals equals seven break. So now if you run this code. Now you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and when it reaches 7, it breaks, similar to our uh, while loop. So this is how you can use the break and continue keyword with uh, the while and uh, for loop, and you can use uh, the break and continue keyword also with the do while loop. Next, we're going to look at how we can nest loops within each other, and we're going to look at an example using the while loop. So I'm going to delete the code of the for loop and the println statement there. I'm gonna delete the if then statement, the break keyword, and I'm gonna bring the println uh, function up there. Down here, I'm gonna declare a variable. It's gonna be a var. I'm gonna call it i, and I'm gonna assign a value of zero to it. Now, inside the while loop, I'm gonna type another while loop. Here, I'm gonna put a condition while i is less than five. We're gonna increment i, and we're gonna print going to output the value of i in the console, but let's put some text here to make uh, clear what loops what loop is looping. So I'm going to put uh, three asterisk signs here. I'm going to type uh, the dollar sign and i. So now if you run this code, let's also change this condition to less than five. So if you run this code. Now we get, first we get one, then we get our uh, code inside of our uh, inner uh, while loop, which is the three asterisks, and we get one, two, three, four, five, then it loops again. But let's take this code line by line to explain what is happening here. So first we declare this variable call number, we assign a value of zero to it, then we loop using the while loop, the outer loop, and it checks to see if this condition is true, and it's true, zero is less than five, so it executes the code inside the curly braces and it increments the value of our number by one, then it outputs the value of our number in the console. So we get here one. Then it declares this variable called i and then it starts looping inside our uh, outer loop while using the inner loop while. So it loops here five times. So when it finishes, it goes back and now the value was incremented by one. It will check again if the condition is true. It will uh, execute the code inside the calibrate, it will increment the value now, so the it will have two, it will output that value, so now we have two here. And then it will uh, loop again five, ti five times using the inner loop, and it will uh, do the same thing for the next round, and the next round, until we get to five. When uh, uh, we'll get to five, five will uh, be not be less than five, and this condition will evaluate to to false and the code inside the calibrate is not going to be executed, All right? And uh, you can use the break keyword inside the inner loop. So I, I can say here if uh, you can put it above here. So you can say if i equals equals zero, then break. And uh, you can put the break and continue keywords in uh, one single line if you want. You can avoid the curly braces. So now if you run this code, now get one, two, three, four, five, because now uh, when it reaches the inner loop, it breaks immediately at every at every iteration in the outer loop. So when it uh, comes down here, it will check uh, to see if the con this condition is true, it's going to be true, but when it gets to the if statement, it will break, it will stop the loop. So uh, it will execute only the outer loop. And with a break uh, keyword, you can not not target only the loop. So with, with this break keyword, we stop, we stop only this while loop that uh, that we are currently, that is currently the nearest loop. 
but there is something which are which is called labels and with labels you can target an outer loop so you can break the outer loop here so you can break the while loop uh, which is here and to do that we we give to our while loop a label so we type here a name i'm going to call it outer and we put at now here you can put break and now i'm going to type at and you put outer and this this should be a single word now if you run this look what happens now you get one because it breaks the outer loop so it first uh, evaluates this condition it increments the value of our number it prints the value of a number and uh, then it uh, goes in the inner loop it checks to see if this condition is true it's true then it checks to see if i is equal to zero which is uh, true then it breaks but now it's not breaking this loop this inner loop it's breaking the outer loop so it's breaking this loop so this is why you get only one and the code is not executed because it breaks the outer loop and the code uh, our program or code it's terminated because about down here we don't have uh, any code so this is how we can use labels with the break keyword to target an outer loop and the labels uh, can be used also with the continue keyword and uh, in uh, other loops that we've uh, looked at so this is our discussion about loops what you can do i should say is that you cannot target with the labels an inner loop from an outer loop so you cannot uh, you can give here a name to a label to our inner loop but you cannot target our inner loop from our outer loop so this is our discussion about loops and in the next video we're gonna do a challenge all right so now it's time to do a challenge using all the knowledge that we have accumulated so far and i'm gonna use uh, the previous project to put my code there but if you don't have the previous project you can create a new project and give it whatever name you want and type your code there so i'm gonna open my previous project i'm gonna delete the code inside the main function now what is the challenge the challenge is to create an arbitrary range of numbers then you need to find a way to go to that arbitrary range of numbers and to determine if uh, a number is an even number or if a number is an odd number and based on that if the number is an odd number skip that number but if the number is an even number then output that number in the console additionally you should create a way to count all the even numbers that you found in your range and display the total numbers of even numbers um, at the end of your program so try to do this solution and uh, after that you can watch my uh, solution to this so first i'm going to defer i'm going to declare a variable called number i'm going to assign a value of one to it next i'm going to de declare another variable but this is going to be a val it's going to be called last number and it's gonna have a value of 20. Now I'm gonna loop using the while loop. And in the parentheses, I'm gonna type while number is less than equal to last number. Then I'm gonna put curly braces. Now I'm gonna increment our number. Now here we need to add the logic to determine if a number is an even number or not. And to do that, I'm going to add the function at the end of our enclosing curly brace of our main function. So I'm going to type here the fun keyword. Now you need to give a name to our function. It's going to be called is even number. I'm going to put parentheses and it's going to take a parameter called number of type int. This function and it's going to return a Boolean value, true or false, this function. So you put colon and we type Boolean. Then you put curly braces and now we add the logic to determine if a, new, a number is even or not so you type here if and now inside the parentheses we put another set of parentheses and here we refer our parameter number that we have defined above and here we put the modulus operator because the modulus operator gives us the reminder of a division so we put the modulus operator two now outside our inner parenthesis we put equals equals zero then we put curly braces and we return true else we're gonna return 
false. Now, how this logic works? So, our, uh, num our number uh, parameter, which is defined here, is going to take an argument. Let's say that uh, it's going to take uh, an arbitrary number. Then it's going to check to see if that number divided by 2 has no reminder. If it, and if it has no reminder, then that number is an even number. Because, the, because even numbers, when they are divided by 2, they have no reminder. And if that is the case, if the, the reminder equals equals to 0, our number is an even number. And it's going to return true, and the else part is not going to be executed. Now, let's add the logic here. Let's use our function here because as you can see now it's uh, gray out, it's not used. So let's type here if, and in the parentheses we're going to type is even number our function, we're going to call our function here, and we're going to pass a parameter to it called, now I'm going to pass the parameter, we're going to pass an argument, and the argument is going to be the variable that we define above. As you can see, you have the v there, so press enter to fill in that for you. Let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. Now, if we press Shift Ctrl P on this, you're gonna see that this is a Boolean expression because this returns true or false. So we can put the logical NOT operator in front of it to change its value, to switch its value from true to false and from and from false to true. So let's put curly braces. And here we're gonna call our continue keyword. Down here, I'm gonna add a println which is going to output uh, the, the number in our console. Next, we need to add the logic to, to count the total, uh, the total even numbers uh, which are found. So I'm going to declare a var. It's going to be even uh, numbers counter. And I'm going to assign a value of 0 to it. And here we're going to increment our even numbers counter. So now, if you run this code, we get 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. So these are the even numbers that they are, that they found, that the, our program found and is correct. But let's add a println at the end of our loop to print the total number of numbers, of even numbers found. So let's put println here and let's put, let's refer our even numbers count here. Even numbers counter. So if you run this, let's put some text actually. Let's put this in curly braces. So let's type here total number of even numbers found equals dollar sign. Now if you run this, now you get total numbers of even, and even numbers found this 10 and this is correct so, and it output uh, correctly our uh, even numbers and it showed that the total number of even numbers found this 10. So let's now think about how this uh, logic works here. So let's look at the if statement that we have here. So what is doing this thing here? So let's take a an, um, an, uh, specific example, uh, a specific number to, to, to see how this works. So let's say that here we pass 4 and it's going to use the logic to determine if this number is an even number and if that number is an even number it's going to return true. So this, this function which is a boolean expression is going to return true and then we're gonna negate this value, we're gonna change this value from true to false, and continue is gonna, not gonna be called. And uh, the code which comes below, which is uh, our variable, which uh, counts how many even numbers uh, we have, it, uh, it increments, then it outputs that number in the console. So we have our even number four output, output it in the console. But if you pass here three, that uh, number is not going to be an even number because has a reminder and this is going to return uh, false and because here you put the logical not operator that is going to be switched to true and the continue, key is gonna, continue keyword is going to be called 
and our code which, which comes below here, which is uh, our variable even number counter is not going to be incremented. And uh, our number, respectively our number 3, is not going to be uh, outputted in the console. So this is how this uh, works. So this is our solution to our uh, to our challenge. Of course, you can simplify this. So if you hover over here, because you have all, all of those underlines, you can see that it says remove redundant if statement. So this can be simplified to this. This does the exact same thing. It is going to return true if this uh, divided by 2 has no reminder. Otherwise, it's going to return false. And this can, can be simplified even further because here we have a single expression and we know when we have a single expression we can write our function as a single expression function. So we can remove the curly braces here. We can remove uh, the boolean return type. We can remove the return keyword. And we're going to put the equal here. And this, now if you run this code, this uh, will work um, the same. So we have the same output here. Now, I use the function here because uh, we've uh, talked about functions in our previous videos. But you can remove the function completely and add the logic to determine if an even number is uh, even or not directly in the if statement. So you can put here if, let's put parentheses, our number now we're going to use the modulus operator to not equal to zero then continue and this will have the same effect so if you run this code this will work uh, in the same way so we have the same uh, code here because this does the exact that the function did previously it will check to see if this is an even number if this is an even number uh, this is not going to be true because here we're checking to see if this is not equal to zero and uh, our number is equal to zero. So this condition inside the, curl, the parenthesis is going to be false. The continue is not going to be called and uh, our code below is going to be called. Our uh, even number counter is going to be incremented and our uh, number is going to be output in the console. So this uh, does the same thing as previously. And we can do this challenge also with a for, st with a for uh, loop if you want. So you can type here for i in 1 to 20, then execute the code inside the curly braces, and here you can uh, check if parenthesis again, if i percent to not equal to zero then call continue then else is gonna execute the code which comes below here which is let's first uh, assign a value of our uh, to a even number counter to zero because when when we're gonna enter in the for loop we should uh, have uh, zero to not have the previous uh, value which was 20 so let's put zero here and here you can increment our even number counter plus plus and we're going to print our even number so we're going to print i here so if you run this code let's run it from here but let's add the print element to make things more clear so i'm going to add here print Let's put quotation marks and here I'm going to type total number of numbers found using for loop R. Let's put the dollar sign. Now let's refer our even number variable. Now if you run this, now we have the exact same output, but now we're using the 
first we're using the while loop then uh, we're using the for loop so let's let's add a println statement between our uh, loops to make clear which loop is looping so let's add a println here and let's type here now we so we are looping using the for loop so now if you run this it will make more clear which loop is looping so now as you can see first the while loop loops then we have our println which says that the, now our while loop our for loop starts looping then we loop with the for loop then at the end uh, we output the total number total number of even only if even numbers found with the while loop we have 10 then we output the total number found uh, the total number of even numbers found using the for loop and r10 so our code works uh, perfectly well and uh, uh, this do not, does not represent the best uh, uh, the best way to solve this challenge of course that you can uh, find a, a totally different way a better way to solve this so this was my this was just my uh, way of solving the problem so see you in the next video and how i hope that you enjoy this challenge